to try to get more support for the channel and all that we plan on doing this year. You've probably seen this Pints with Aquinas beer stein. This month, January, and this month only, we will be giving this beer stein away for free to anybody who becomes an annual supporter over at mattfrad.locals.com. When you join mattfrad.locals.com right now, you'll get access to free audiobooks, uh, exclusive podcasts. You'll have the ability to ask my guests questions. You'll also get access to our quarterly newspaper that's sent to your front door called The Jill. And we even pay the shipping for that one, by the way, whether you live in Australia or wherever. Uh, so we're really excited about that. We have a lot of big things coming up this year that I can't yet understand. Um, uh, reveal, but it's going to cost a lot of money. And so <laughs> one of the ways to make sure that we can do these things is by your support, quite frankly. So please become a local supporter. Uh, sign up on your desktop or laptop, not on your phone, please. When you do that, um, we'll have a pinned post to the top of Locals showing you how to get this free beer stein. And again, this free beer stein is only for people who become annual supporters in January. You just have to pay shipping, but we'll send it wherever. So if you know you live in Europe or Australia or China, we can send it there to you as well. Huge thank you. Um, I think Locals is actually social media. It's kind of what social media should have been, but never became. So when you join us over on Locals, you're not just getting those free perks that I spoke about. You're also joining a online community of like-minded Catholics who kind of give each other the benefit of the doubt and, and ask for prayers and share their struggles. It's been really quite beautiful. So thank you to those who would consider supporting mattfrad.locals.com. And if you can't do that, you could at least subscribe. So please subscribe, hit the bell button. Thanks so much. Whatever you, I love my stones. And we're live with Aussie comedian... Donald Forbes McCann. Hello, everybody. Great to have you on the show. Oh, nice to be back. Last time I had you on the show, it was it was right after just meeting you, and you did a great stand-up comedy bit at the Scar Lounge. I felt so bad about how that went. Did you? Every gig, I felt bad about. How do you feel after you give a talk? I feel bad after every time I, I feel, speak to people. I feel shame and yeah. insecurity. Yeah, I think of everything I wish I had done better, which is a lot every time. I feel that way if I share it vulnerably. Which I suppose is what comedians often do, in a way. I just feel slow. I feel like if the timing is wrong for a second, it's nice about a talk. You don't have to worry as much. Well, hello, birthday boy. <laughs> it is Thursday's birthday today, everybody. 25 and never been kissed. That's, that's not true. That's that couldn't not be true. I'll, give you, true. I'll give you a big <laughs> Eastern European style birthday kiss if so you want. Th Thursday, um, so Thursday has really tried, tried hard to introduce me to video games. Oh, man. And I want to be into video games, but he said the other day to me something very insightful. He's like, I actually think you don't like video games. He said, like, you like stuff from the 90s and you like the idea of video games. And that's true. Yeah. So Thursday, I got you a gift. Oh, 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 um, oh, 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 hold on. Let you me can make sit down or birthday. stand next to him either get way. In, get in. All right. So let's see. All right. Oh, you ready? Bump that camera. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> no way. Super is that what Nintendo? they look like in America? That is an original Super Nintendo. <laughs> Holy cow. And I've got this you is amazing. Is it? Good. Yeah. I'm glad you like it. And I got you two games that I used to love playing. Okay. One, Sim City. Not Sin, Sim. The original Sim City. And be this game. I, honestly, I remember laying awake at night thinking if I just had a Super Nintendo with the following game I'm about to give you, I would be happy. And what you needed was Jesus. <laughs> I know, I didn't know. Street Fighter 2. Let's go. Come That's on. so cool. This is awesome. And then there's your, you know, the... Oh, it's the turbo version. Look at that. Turbo version? Yeah. It means you got the, the sumo wrestler. Nice. I don't know what that means. Honda? I think it's that. That's, that's right. I was born after Honda. the stage. Yeah, you mash, pa mash punch. And, there's and then these. there's like the controller and everything in there. And yeah. We love you. You're awesome. Thanks for all Thanks, the hard Matt. work this you do on Pines. This is amazing, Pines. actually. This is I'm awesome. so glad. I said you don't get your hopes up because... No, I got my... I didn't get them up, and I'm glad I didn't. Wait, is there... I should have. Is yeah. there a controller in there? Yep. Yeah. Just one, well, unfortunately. Good, otherwise, you'd just be s s looking at watching. the intro screen, <laughs> watching it. <laughs> <laughs> but the music would be pretty sick. Oh, I love Street Fighter. Yeah. Yeah, they kept going. I didn't follow it on. I yeah, quit no, video Street games Fighter like 10 years ago. It was a game changer. Well, I, was, I was too... I didn't remember it changing the game. That's my, like, default... This is a fighting game. It was that in Mortal Kombat. Yeah. I couldn't believe they had Mortal Kombat in public places. You could rip someone's spine out while families were watching. Yeah. 
Isn't yeah. that bizarre? It was a bit bizarre. Were you a Mortal Kombat? I know you've got Sub Zero up there. I loved. I I was there. I had a. Remember in Australia, we call it Sega Master System. I think they call it something different here. But I had Mortal Kombat One. Yeah. And I could never beat Raiden, so I just chose to be him. That's... And then, um, yeah, Mortal Kombat Two, Mortal Kombat Three, and then I got big into Tekken. Mm. Do you ever play Tekken? Yes, I would choose to play King. Were you? I was and the Marshall guy who Law. dances. Which one was Martial Law? He was the Bruce Lee looking fella. Oh yeah. There was a guy who would do like yeah. Bra- Brazilian he was the Jamaican dances. dude. I forget his name. I like that. I uh, I was big into video games until like until I read the book that I gave to Thursday that he hasn't read Crime and Punishment and then I couldn't play them anymore. I don't know what happened. Something snapped inside of me really? and I was trying to finish Mass Effect Two. I got halfway through Mass Effect Two and I was done. I'm at the point, and this is going to sound pretentious, and maybe it is, but I get the same rush from yeah. like reading an academic study or reading a good book by Dostoevsky that I used to get playing a video game. What yeah. I loved about video games was that it absorbed 100% of my brain energy, and yeah. I felt sucked into something, and I didn't feel scattered. I felt all of my energy it's, was concentrated on I would have gotten thing. into drugs in a big way as a teenager if I wasn't playing video games, 100%, because it's the same thing yeah it's like just i don't want to think about any of the rest of my life yeah it's a bit like six that. hours which i now i cannot do drugs or video games either there's no t- oh, the kids the kids yeah. are too small i am last night was bad i complained to your wife on the drive here what happened i got uh street fighter 2 style heel kicked in my chest by my baby <laughs> just right in the sternum he brought the heel down <laughs> <laughs> was he sitting on your belly how did that happen? he was like just lying on the bed he woke up we were both asleep he twisted I won't do it now. I'll pull a hamstring. Yeah. And I, um, you know, you become, you can't stay that angry with a baby. Yeah. Because it's you inappropriate shouldn't. and they're very small. <laughs> but boy, I was angry with my baby. Well, what's funny is when you get hurt, there is this initial visceral. I'm going to fight back. Yeah. I could take you. Yeah. And then you go, no, we won't. Yeah. We'll be the bigger person. A lot of it is fighting. Man, when I speak to young parents about involuntary thoughts and all that, like they think it's going to be. They know it's going to be bad to have a baby because everyone has braced them. Yeah. You know, it's, but no one tells them you're going to feel violent at two in the morning yeah. and you're going to have to do something with that. Yeah. And, and no one's ready for that. Yeah. No one's ready for waves of. I'm shocked that so many babies live. They are just. <laughs> do you know what I mean? No, I do. I remember before I got married hearing of a woman who, you know, shook her baby. Yeah. Or like threw a baby how to a could crib. You? And you're like, how could a you do such a thing? And, and obviously like, that's a monstrous thing to do. Yeah. But you get why people get crazy because oh, you don't sleep for 72 no hours. Judgment. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of judgment. It's not just good. not a lot. It's not good and you can't do don't it. Don't get me wrong. I don't shake my back. I've realized that people can hear what I'm saying. Yeah. Lots of I them. never mistreat my children at yeah. all. But last night I did raise my voice. That was about as... I raised my voice at everybody. I said, this is not good. I didn't say that. I, t- I used some choice words yeah. that I now regret. <laughs> then I apologized to my wife this morning. Yeah, it's the way to do it, man. Every day, <sighs> apologizing to my family. It's so it's a slow death, man. To sleep. When does that come back? Uh, it's got to come back soon. I've got brain damage. I would say for by the sure. time your kids are four and five, all of them, youngest is four uh, or five, then you'll be out of sleep. I don't see that ever happening. I didn't either. I'm going to start riding a bicycle and standing in front of microwaves. So I got to just slow it down, just for a moment. <laughs> Which we're allowed to do. As Catholics. Oh, I get it. I Francis just... <laughs> says you don't have to breathe like rabbits. Yeah, sure. Stand in front of a microwave. So I want to hear about your trip to Austin and to yeah. Joe Rogan's club. It's the best club I've ever performed at. So first of all, uh, when, Cards did, on table. when did he start this and what what is it like? Is Post-COVID. It new... Okay. Uh, he, bu- he used to be a punk music venue in downtown Austin. And he uh, after COVID, he moved to Austin. I didn't get to meet him. He was on holidays with his family. But I got to meet everyone who is in the Joe Rogan orbit, I guess, which was cool. Um, and he just, he said, he like, he, he's got so much money from, I guess, a life of doing comedy and that Spotify deal. Mm, he just mm. went like, well, what if I build the perfect comedy club that's exactly what I want it to be? And he did. I mean, it's things that, that everybody should do that would be affordable for everyone to put in their clubs. In the green room, there are two screens where you can see what's happening on stage And that when they get the light, you get the light in the green room. So no one is taken by surprise when someone finishes their set. It's like every small detail. Help me understand, because I've never been to a comedy club, especially not to perform. So what does this comedy club have other than that that most comedy clubs don't? Oh, man. They take everyone's phones at the door and they put them in those 
you're not allowed to use this phone bags. They have great security. They have, oh, man, the stage is, I mean, most comedy clubs, the stage is at the wrong level. You go in and you, you the, st the stage is like. Too low, too high. Often too high. And it's too, and you can't talk down to people like that doing comedy. It yeah. feels weird. Yeah. It's acoustically perfect. They're like, the roof is at the right. Sometimes it's a cavernous thing. The way they're sitting, you want people around you so that their laughter hits you immediately. It's loud. You sort of want it to be like a bus I see. on its side. And the further back they are, the less they can contribute. And yeah. like everyone's just there, in next to you. It's uh, that's awesome. Oh, it's magical. I, I was terrified I of doing badly. Like you get, you get. The, this is the perfect circumstances for comedy. If I'm bad now, I I'm do bad. have to quit. Yeah, I want to. I want to get to how you did, but I love the idea of phones in the bags. When who phones started that? And do you know? Was that Jerry Seinfeld? Might have been Seinfeld. Might have been. It's such a beautiful idea. Dave Chappelle was doing it because I think they early must. On. They must do it for copyright reasons. But it also mm. just helps people be with each well, other. Well, they don't want to. I think a lot of people are trying stuff out, and you never want people to see you fumbling right. through. Because it's it starts out very offensive, and then by the end, it's okay. What do you mean? <laughs> well, just any bit. You have an idea for a bit. Oh, I see. Uh, maybe the bit is shaking a baby and accidentally not having that baby <laughs> anymore afterwards. And you say that wrong fifteen times. You know, yeah, there's something in it yeah. that's funny to yeah. communicate. But all someone has to do is have their phone out and yeah. record that bit, and then you are the. Well, that monster. must give you a lot of freedom, eh? Yeah. Like, as a performer, were you well, like, not, okay, this is Not nice. me at that show, because I was also like, f wonderful people are watching me. In the, this is my first gig in America. Yeah. I was also terrified that the references wouldn't work. Yeah. And then uh, someone said, just treat them like an Australian audience and it'll be fine. And right. it was. Right, it was so, fine. So, Litus, how, how yeah. did you apply? Uh, I don't know how it works. I, at, at the, is it just an open, open mic? or One was an open mic. That was how I got to audition there. Uh, in front of... It's run by... Adam Egot, who was the Norm sidekick McDonald. of Norm yeah. Macdonald. Yeah, yeah, and the whole time there I'm going, you, you, you're you Norm Macdonald. Wow. You're a, you deny the Holocaust. He doesn't really. That's yeah. just a joke that, that Norm used to say. Um, but he made it. I mean, six, six million. It's too many either way. So yeah, that's, that's, right. that's a joke. Right. Again, that's a Norm joke. There's going to be a lot of jokes in yeah. this episode. I if you don't have a sense of humor, you should just go watch another it. video. Ah, there's, there's a lot out there for people on the algorithm. Oh, oh really? man, it was so nice. And okay, then so, I got put on because my friend Shane was doing the whole week. And I turned up in Austin. I was ahead of Do my family. You, um, so the stand-up night where they select you to... Man. To, is it a different night of the week? Is yeah. That how so I they... think that was on, on Mondays they have sign-up and people drive in from hours around wow. to put their name in the bucket and, wow. and get on. So how many were on the same night as you when you were trying out? There were like 12 people on before me and then wow, the that's bar quick. So people also work at the bar. How quick is your set? It was... Everyone was doing three minutes. How bad was everyone who came with you? Two guys were great. Yeah? Ten guys were, uh, you know, just normal open mic people. What was weird, so the first gig I went to was Kill Tony, which was- uh, it's What's like that? A, it's Tony Hinchcliffe does this, it's like pro wrestling meets stand-up comedy. So people put their, their names in and they do one minute of comedy. Okay, and then wow. a panel of really good comedians- One minute. Strips off them. It's, uh, it's impossible to be good at a minute. You know, like you can't, hello folks, how are you going? And then they ring the bell. Yeah. So I went to, and that was 8,000 people in the HEB arena, which I thought was pronounced the Heb arena and people <laughs> let me know that that was incorrect. And uh, I hadn't slept in like 35 hours and I got to Austin and someone said, do you want to get on the bus? And I said, sure, we're what, in America. What does that mean, get on the bus? Oh, it was, it was Shane Gillis was the Shane. Oh, he... Shane Gillis oh, you was know doing, Shane Gillis. Yes, so I was staying at his place, but I feel, wow. I mean, he's also, I opened for him in Australia. Okay. He's a lovely man, and he's also now the most successful comedian in the world, so yeah, I feel that, like happened? dropping. Uh, he was cancelled. And I Saturday Night Live, Live literally ended his contract. He was meant to start as a cast men, member, and they, uh, they looked through his old podcast and they said, you can't be doing some of these things and be on Saturday Night Live. And um, he just kept doing stand-up and is... Because separately he, to being a great sketch actor, a, the best stand-up comedian working. I would say maybe two months ago, he started exploding across my algorithm. And I didn't know yeah. who he was or where he came from. Yeah. He does the best Trump impersonation I've ever heard. He does the hand. He says, yeah, the trick. He said, do the hands a second after they're oh, meant to move. The hands are not incredible. quite connected to the voice. He's really good at it. He's also got the new Trump, the old Trump. So he got you to do a stand-up. Uh, a kind I, of I opened for him up. with some of his friends, so he had a bunch of his friends. Oh, I see. So, so you performed at the actual I people the are expecting to be, yeah, big yeah. Room. Well, okay. no, and they are. I mean, they're waiting to see him, and then he's gone. 
seven people beforehand. Oh, and that, they're very gracious. Are they? The audience, yeah. I had such a nice time. Oh, I so also ha- have to reset. Not every American crowd is going to be like the dream, at Joe Rogan's comedy club there to see Shane Gillis. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm going to get some bad crowds at some point. But if all of America can stay like that. Having an Aussie accent is going to help you. I think it buys you a minute. It or does. Two. That's yeah. what I say. I say yeah. the same thing when I give talks at high yeah, schools. Yeah. I'm like, it buys me a minute and then. And then I'll listen to what I'm actually hopefully. saying. Hopefully. Oh. If the minute was okay. Hmm. So how I know you said you feel deep shame and remorse after you get off stage. Every but time, how did you think it went objectively? People around me were telling me it went well, and that I was allowed to come back there, which is usually that the, the trick. Is insane. But I'm there, you know, sweating, going, "I said that word wrong. I did that yeah. thing. I, there was that five minutes." But that's often. It's always weird when a comedian thinks that. Some people will come off stage and they'll be okay, and they'll be like fist bumping everybody, and then they'll go, "I'm the king of the world. I'm the man." You go, "Ah, you were okay." Yeah. I think it's that. What's the name of the effect where, like, the better you are at something? Imposter syndrome, maybe? No, it's that too. Something like that? It's like uh, Donning Bar or something where, like, the more you know about something, the more you know. What well, also how kind of badly reminds me of our, of our, our Blessed Lord's it? words, right? Of, t- of taking the lower seat. Yes. And then being invited up to the higher one. Like, you would rather have a kind of posture of humility, knowledge paradox. Knowledge, yes. You I would rather have a posture paradox. of humility and be like, no, you actually did great, you know. Than- I then feel weird saying it's the knowledge paradox and the Dun- it's the Dunning-Kruger, but then that sets mm-hmm. me up as, I only think I did badly because I'm so fabulous, yeah. and that's not good. I was thinking about how good hell is as a, just as a, to have it. Hell? Because it, yeah, because okay. it makes Explain. us afraid all the time, huh. and it gives us a reason for altruism, that you don't have to fake it, right? I do not understand well, your Well, when you're being, you're being kind to people, and sometimes you think, I'm being kind to this person... Because it's good to be altruistic, so yeah. therefore I'm not really being altruistic. You're right. So I'm wrapped up in this, like... But if you think about hell... Dunning-Kruger is when people who are stupid think they are smart. Yeah. But it was recently disproven, apparently. It's by someone who was smart and wanted everyone to know that <laughs> they never had to be humble about it. So what were some... But you know what? But you know what I mean? Hold on. I wanna, I wanna, this is my new thought about hell. All right. Lead me through it. Altruism on its own, it doesn't make sense from a secular point what of is, view. What is altruism? I know, I know what it is. <laughs> kind, kind, uh, kindness just on, for the, the sake of kindness? Of the other for the sake of the other. Yeah. And, you know, and you give someone something, you yeah. know, like a, you give a bum on the street $10 and you think, but I also want to be seen yeah. to be giving the bum on the street $10. I want to be the sort of man who does that. I want him to know yeah, yeah. that I'm a good person. Totally. But when there's hell and you're not, it, it's not, you're actually, you're trying to live out a life to escape from your own are burning forever, then it removes that complication of why am I doing this? What is this for? What oh, is a good person? I am I a good person? Am I pretending to be a good person? I am afraid of going to hell and everything is just running away from that. It, it simplifies. Well, here's what's going to happen throughout the course of this interview. You're going to say things that you may mean to be funny and I'm not going to get it. I, that's, and I don't mean that to be funny. Well, that's my big how, well, theological then, okay, breakthrough. Well, well, then here's what I think. I mean, yeah. I, I think I want to be obedient because Christ commands something. And then what I realize within me is that I have ulterior motives when I do the things Christ commands me. But then I think as you start to kind of mature, you realize, okay, well, sure, I, I do have ulterior motives, but that's not a good reason to not do those things. So yes. I'm going to do them and realize that I'm not fantastic. Well, and in the act of contrition, they, I love that they put both. They go, you know, and I, <clears throat> I'm apologizing to you, God, because of hellfire, but also because I'd love you so yes, much. Yes. And there is that whole, there's that Eastern mystic tradition of like, if I do this to go to heaven, don't let it count for anything, mm. which, you know, it's okay to be imperfect in why you're doing a good thing. I think, you know, you've, it's good yeah. to have both. It's when it's given to us for our salvation that there is a hell. Well, you have those kind of moral categories, right? Like in order to assess a moral act, the object has to be good but so too does the circumstances and the intention. Yes. And so if the intention's bad, mm. then it's not a good act. So if I do give yes. money to the bum just to impress you, yeah. there's something deficient in that act. It doesn't mean there wasn't some good. There's something. There's still a good in wanting yeah, to right. impress no, me. Totally. I'm a man no, worth, worth impressing. Yeah, but if I'm Even if it becomes a very small you, good, yeah. you know? But if I'm trying to impress you. It is. I mean, we're all a mess of complicated ambitions. Yeah. So best, to, it's almost best not to try to untangle that web and just try to be faithful to Christ's command and repent yes. at all times. But we, I mean, we live in a weird post-Freudian society where everyone's like trying to pick apart the subconscious motives for, you know, their yeah. relationships and why they're there for people. And yeah. It's so nice to just simplify it and go. What's Shane Gillis for like? God. He's a really sweet guy. He's a wonderful man. I don't have a bad word to say about him. He's, we'll uh, say some good things about him. Well, 
I don't know. The week I was there, I mostly we he played a lot of video games, and I watched him, and what I had a good time. I mean, he was would... playing. I don't. It was some game where you were. Thursday may know this one. I don't know the answer. You were like a, you start out as a peasant farmer on the run in a big kingdom, mm. and you have to build up a squad and kill other peasant farmers who are also just working for other warlords <laughs> until you are a mighty team. Rust. Rust. I don't think it was Rust. There must be a lot of games like that. So he's not, he's not married then, so he's got time to devote to video games. Maybe. He's not, a, yes, yeah. yeah. Even then. Oh. My, my insight recently was that modern video games are very long. Mm. They take a lot of time to play, a lot of hours to put in. Yeah. And I don't have that kind of time, and so when I hear about a good game, like, that sounds like a great game, I'd love yeah. to try and play that. But what would happen is I'd play it for 30 minutes and I'd have to go home be with the kids or, you know, do That'll be, be the cool. sign that you become properly addicted is that you pivot to streaming, like just video games. On this like, channel. This is what I do. This is my work, honey. I have to go and play video games for eight hours today to put food on the table. Yeah. It's not me. It's the job. Yeah. I dream about that a lot. Oh, just having a... I, I have to go and play Civilization V. Were you in... What games did you play as a kid? How, oh, how old are you? 33? 30, 30, 30, 30, about turned 33. Sweet. Uh, Final Fantasy VII was the first one I sunk a lot of time into. I loved Final Fantasy VII and I never finished it. I deleted the game accidentally right at the end when I was teaching my brother how to play it. And then I accidentally saved over my file and I never went back to it. It's, it haunts me to this day. Yeah. It's one of the most silly, important <laughs> things I've ever done. I think that video games can be sort of recreational, but people have to know themselves and realize that very often it becomes dissociative. And you're I just... think they're, they're worse than drugs. I would rather. Really? Yeah. In terms of, I look at my friends' lives and I guess it depends where they're drugs. And... That's true. I mean, fentanyl will just take you out and look at the split. <laughs> And often video games and drugs I should have kept playing Command and Conquer. Yeah. Well, that's a good one. Have you seen the one Great where Jordan one. Peterson is the bad guy who pops up on the screen? No. They have his like, listen here, woke leftists. But he's like... In what video games? In Command and Conquer. Really? We're like, it's usually a Russian guy who pops up and goes, I will destroy you. And so mm. it's Jordan Peterson going, I'm coming after you. In one of his beautiful spiels. I don't know what else. I, I mean, it's it takes so much time. And then also someone is, someone has built it to try and trick you into continuing to play it. Yeah. And that's that's very annoying. I right. like chess a great deal. And yes. thank you for bringing out the chess board the other night yeah. with, and I forget his name. Dr. Mike Welker. He was a very gracious chess partner and I had a great time. What's cool about Dr. Welker is he's a you know, PhD in economics. Yeah. He also is like third degree black belt and then also a deacon. A deacon? So like Dr. Deacon Sensei, Mr. How many titles does a man need? Make, give him a knighthood and get it over. <laughs> well, they don't like that here. Yeah. The monarchy is, that was my big pushback. I did argue with Shane about monarchy. Mm. That was my one, it was a one, and a lot of Americans, I feel, are not ready to accept that it's a superior way of uh, running a country. Where are you on that? Oh, I don't have enough developed thoughts to go into that live. <laughs> I just love it. But I'd be open to talking about it I just love the king. Yeah. So you were doing comedy prior to your conversion. Yes. Could you, could you tell me about your conversion, how that even came about? Yeah. Um... I was like nominally Christian. I was, we grew up Unitarian. And uh, just, it's like just a very wishy-washy church in okay. Adelaide. And uh, when I was on the road, I would go to like mega churches just to perversely look at them. Yeah. Because it's a tremendous spectacle at is this, 10 a.m. Is this before you were married or after? This before I was married. Yeah. Yeah, I kept doing it while we were dating. And then um, I had a friend who was going to the Latin Mass and I said, which I had heard about there were people in Adelaide who senators went to the Latin mass and like yeah. great writers and thinkers in Adelaide. And I thought, oh, I'll go along. I'll look at it. Cause I'd been to the Novus Ordo and it, it can be, it, it can it, be done well. I but now have been isn't. going to it for the last five weeks in various places and I don't have a problem with yeah, it. Yeah, me neither. But as a, as a spectacle on the way in, it didn't immediately strike me as yeah. something that I wanted to do every Sunday for the rest of my life. But the Latin mass. So who, who suggested you go and what was it like? My friend, uh, Paul had started going and his, uh, his sister and his brother-in-law. And it was great. It was only, it was 200 people at the time. It's now like six times bigger and there's no space to have your increasingly large family. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the priest complains about how many people there are. I like, you met this priest in Adelaide. He's uh what does he say? He like, they just, he'll just come over and go, there's so many people here, James. <laughs> and it's like, well, you, you know, you could be like all the other priests and tell them condoms are fine. But you, you know, you're yeah. sticking to the catechism, and yeah. people keep growing out of the yeah. ladies who come to this mass. 
And people are showing up as we, well we, separate to that. We want a re-enchanted world. And oh. many of the banal parishes just aren't there to offer it. We want to be told to repent. We want to be invited into a bigger story. And this is why traditional parishes are exploding. Well, also, like life. if God is is dying in front of you and saving the world, would you just stand and say that? Like it, it, that doesn't seem to reflect the grandeur of yeah. the thing that's meant to be happening in front of you. But when there's like men walking around and you don't know what's going on and there's incense and there's... Yeah. I went to the... There used to be a Catholic bookstore in Adelaide. And oh, I, I went to try that. to figure out... Yeah, uh, St. Paul, Pauline's, Pauline's. Pauline's. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I met the. I went to the mass, and then the priest happened to be there. And I said, "I'm trying to find a book that explains the Latin mass and what's going on." And he said, "If you figure it out, you tell me." Who said that? My the, priest. Yeah, the, Father the Latin mass. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's terrific. And uh, I thought, oh, that's a cool thing to say. I will keep going. But it's yeah. I mean, it's just it's so weird and mysterious. And so, so you Paul brought in you and out. there. And what was it, what was your experience of it like? The it, first was, time because you, you didn't grow up Catholic, so this is really the first kind of. Yeah, I mean, it was weird and complicated, and it felt it was also the, it was the second week of Lent, and so everything is purple, oh, yeah. and then you come back and everything's pink, and it's all purple again, and then it's Christmas, and it's like just on that run of it's like is every week different? Yeah, is every week a weird color and a weird yeah. new song? And there was, uh, I think it was God of Mercy and Compassion was the hymn, which is it's uh, as an Advent hymn. I think I said I don't know if I said Lent before, but like all the Advent hymns are yeah, you, sad, but they're also optimistic and you go this is like so much more complicated than the christian music yeah like the theme being conveyed here is i have sinned i want god to help me he will help me i shouldn't presume that there's so much more in that than yeah yeah baby you're my savior which is good too yeah but there's an intellectual component to catholicism which you don't have to have it's a good peasant religion as well but it's like it didn't feel dumb it didn't feel like they were trying to dumb it down for me at all it's like here's the thing that we're doing you can come to it and enjoy it, and we hope you continue coming back, but we're not going to mess with what we're doing yeah. to make it easier for you. It's not it, about that. You wouldn't want that in the long run. No, it's so respectable. It'd be like dating a woman who was willing to lower her standards as opposed to saying... I mean, that can be good too. <laughs> no, it yeah, can't. Excuse me. Um, so, <laughs> it's the uh, way I'm married now. If she held that for a good man, I'd still be, be, screwed. I'd be single. <laughs> That's funny. So, okay, so from your first mass to... What was the journey to getting... Uh, going to RCIA or coming. uh no, well, I just did catechism with the with the priest, uh, very slowly because I was touring all the time and I was asking a lot of. I really pushed back in the catechism, yeah. a lot. What did you find unpalatable or difficult to swallow? I mean, everything. It's oh. it's just well, it's like it's an entirely different way of seeing the world. I guess the biggest pushback was the hierarchy of the church, mm-hmm. which seems. Being a Unitarian and then nominally Protestant, yeah, uh, it seems like Christ is saying that's bad. <clears throat> like he's talking to the Pharisees a lot, I and see, he's talking yeah. about. And the priest said, "Well, he's is he talking about that organized religion or organized religion in general?" And you right. go, "All right, I gotta totally, I gotta go back to it and rethink it all." Yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, call no man father, mm-hmm. and then what we're calling every priest father. I'm going to need that explained to me. Yep. I mean, there's so many things like that. Was there? Why some- is it all covered in gold? I like that it's all covered in gold. I like that there's beautiful finery everywhere. Aren't we meant to sell everything and help the poor? But yeah, was there something about but, Catholicism that many Protestants find difficult to accept? That you're like, no, no, this one's easy. Oh, that's a complicated question. Isn't no, it, it is. Uh, I don't know. I have to think about it. Because there are, there are to this day, I because guess, a lot of... I, prayers so, to Our Lady, of, the Rosary, was those things difficult? No, I mean, I find Anglicans and Episcopalians just don't care about Mary. Like, it, she doesn't figure... They're not opposed to the oh, Mary not, yeah. stuff. It's yeah. just like, it seems alien and a bit odd as a fixation to them. And then among Lutherans, I mean, some are caught up financially in it. People who... I know a lot of people who like work for the, I mean, the, the Lutherans you're financially taken care of if you're a priest. So it would be very hard to walk away from. Yeah. When you became Catholic, were you provision. married at that point? No. We, there were some people there who uh, had us live in different places for a while. Well, hang on. So, while we were courting because oh, so they found it inappropriate that we were <laughs> living together and coming to Mass. Oh, I see. So you were living together, going to mass. But they were very good about it. They were very gentle they and jerks, kind. Yeah. But no one was a jerk about it. Yeah. But uh, so they what, let us know there was a better way to do it if we wanted to, and that they would help us. That's beautiful. Yeah. And was she, was your wife becoming Catholic at that same time? Or we was started she... going at the same time, and wow. 
Yeah. What was it like to learn about the church's teaching on contraception as two people about to get married, presumably? I mean, we didn't know anyone with a lot of kids, so it just seemed like a sensible thing to do. Yeah. To you'll be squitting them out forever. Mm. And uh, which I still think, you know, like if it wasn't for my wife's had a series of health problems mm. having children, but the actual having of children is not. And you it's make great. Very it's beautiful so great. Children well, we were. Stop at the first yeah, ugly good. one. They're good. Well. They're beautiful to someone. <laughs> they're, um, yeah, I don't know. I didn't find that to be troubling. I guess on a gut level, I was aware that contraceptives were gross. Were you? Condoms are gross. They are gross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a whole video about that. We'll link to it yeah. below. Yeah. So I guess I didn't mind that. I mean, I didn't think about how hard it would be, probably because I lacked the imagination to think about what not sleeping was going to be like. And getting kicked in the sternum. Yeah, I'm still pretty angry at my boy. Was 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 it you kind of calling your wife into this new thing you've discovered? No, it was well, odd. She she was very in it. It's hard now because I know I know in a secular world that it looks harder for a woman to become a Catholic and less appealing than a man. Okay, because having a lot of children is it's very burdensome on a woman's mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. We live in a society where a woman working is important. Like yeah. She's got to get runs on the board and yeah. make money. And that's not really something you'll be. Some people manage to do it, which I find incredible, but there's no, there's no way she's pulling in money at the moment. Yeah, not yeah. least of which that we're on a visa where that's illegal. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, certainly I think she's, she's had more pushback and I'm sometimes afraid of appearing, you know, like, like I'm some domineering husband who's dragged her into yeah. conservative religion. Uh, but she's, there have been various times where my faith has been no good and she's pulled me back in and mm -hmm. vice versa. I think doing it as a couple is, I, I recommend it. I recommend bringing your man or woman along if you can. So two questions. Um, w were you nervous about coming out as a Catholic, as a stand-up comic? No, I loved, I loved talking about it. It's weird. Because we just had Shane Smith on the other day and he got a lot of beautiful comments from mm. secular people and Catholic people alike. Like his Instagram was filled with people who were like, I'm not Catholic, but I respect yeah, yeah. this. And pray. But there was also a lot of pushback sure. as well. But I, I was blessed to be very unsuccessful. At that point, yeah. Well, even, even now. <laughs> there's just not a lot of people who care I see. about what I do. But certainly, Cause I, hear that I was pretty conservative beforehand. And okay. if anything, I've become more soft and groovy and left wing. I was like, I loved Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Pretty, I read The so Fountainhead like, and Atlas Shrugged and I was like, we so don't need medicine right, for the poor. More right in terms of economics. Yes. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. But I I mean, you can't be a young person and read The Fountainhead and not. Have you ever read The Fountainhead? No. It's, it's, it's like a fever dream of just be great, go achieve yeah, greatness, yeah, yeah. go build skyscrapers. <laughs> but um, I mean, I hear that- So the, I was probably unbearable and I think I was made easier company by having become Catholic. I hear that- uh, comic clubs and hanging out in the scene is quite difficult. A lot of ladies, a lot of drugs. Is that not the case? And if it is, how I did still you... find that very difficult. Yeah. I went to that Kill Tony show and there were some very friendly and beautiful strippers really? backstage. Yeah. How do you... How Wonderful do you... time. It was very hard to practice custody of the eyes. Yeah, how do you... Know and I didn't know I was going to be there or that that was going to happen. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you try and look people in the eye and have a... They weren't like working as strippers at the time. They were doing the show and coming backstage with, without trousers on. But um, you just try and, you know. But even then, someone said, this, now watch out, ladies. This man's a very conservative Catholic. And this stripper looked me in the eye and she was like, God bless you. That's so beautiful. And I thought, yeah. it's a bit different in America. No one in Australia is really happy for you that you're holding to your conservative religion. Yeah. But there is, you say, have a blessed day to people here. And people act like that's just something to say. Yeah. Such a beautiful part of the culture. Because... You have a lot of vulgar mm. comedy. I'm very vulgar. You have a lot of language, a lot of sexual talk. I mean, has that changed since your conversion or will it change, do you think? Or if not, why is it okay? I just saw Nate. Do you know Nate Bargatze? I think I'm saying that right. I just saw his comedy for the first time and he works clean and he's so funny that I had a big crisis. I was like, ah, I've thrown it all away being dirty and blue. I, I want to be like this man. I want to. And it, even before I was a Catholic, it was closing doors, being vulgar. Like, I don't get a lot of work on cruise ships performing <laughs> for people's families. Uh, and the big one was I was working on commercial radio. I don't know if we spoke about this last time, but that was like, just before I was becoming a Catholic, I was doing 
breakfast radio on the weekends in Adelaide and working for people on the weekday show. And then I was going through catechism while I was doing yeah. my first presenting spot. Yeah. And it became, because you can't be vulgar on radio, but also you you can't, I've got this new evolving morality yeah. where I'm, you know. Just trying had, to find where the line is well, maybe. the zeal or? of a convert that anyone yeah. says anything against God or flippant about God that I'm pushing back in a big kind of weird way for 9am on a Sunday morning or whatever. Yeah. It's like when you fall Saturday. in love and someone says something against your girlfriend, you can't just sit there. Yeah, your back gets up, you're ready to fight a duel. And then also the woke thing was starting to come in. The, uh, it hadn't quite reached commercial radio, but I knew it was out there. And if I, and they'd be like, just use a Chinese accent for this bit. And you'd go, I don't, I don't know that that's going to be good for me it's right true. now to be, I know you're not afraid of that, but I, I feel bad. So it's like three morality codes that you're trying to live up to at any given time. And it's, maybe you can write a sketch or a poem or something that, that can be censored in all those ways. But if you're being genuine, yeah. you can't keep track of that many yeah. things at once. So I, I sort of decided at that point that I would keep to what I thought was important, which is I love God. I love the natural law. I love the catechism. That's as close to my morality as I'm, I can hold. Yeah. So <laughs> vulgarity at the same time, it's like, well, what I, 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 like I would never say something I think that was, I didn't, I couldn't religiously get behind. Well, what about just swearing? I think that's fine. Yeah. In certain circumstances, there are instances. I don't think. I don't think where it's bad. I, I certainly don't think talking about sexual, explicitly sexual things, is a good thing. And you do that. I do. I I, I can only speak positively about what I think. Now I will say this because I'm I'm going to push you a bit. Yeah, I'll before, take it. I'll but, take before, it. but before I do that. I find that the times I've heard you say things like that, I, I kind of like the point you're making. So there seems yeah. to be this Catholic point that you're making behind a bunch of language. <laughs> yes. I'm, please don't say it, but the Instagram joke, right? Like you refresh. Oh, you I don't want to see oh, that. Let's not get into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But the point is like th there is a sense in which you're like, I'm a Catholic and I don't want this. So I, I do think a lot of the time it's like, it's almost like you're a covert uh, Catholic in the sense that I see these secular people belly laughing and yet you're making this beautiful point for chastity or a big marriage. Yes. I'm not sure. The la I'm, I'm quite convinced that the language and the vulgarity doesn't justify the end point. Sure, That's sure, my, sure. my position. But. I I know that has to be a weird personal thing. And right. I, I do, I moderate my language in certain instances, but... Uh, no, I don't... Yeah. No, I, I know what you mean. Because I'm not I sure how I feel People about accuse me sometimes of being tricky or like, what are you... Yeah. They go like... How are you a Catholic and doing that? Or yeah. how, you know, and I, or, or I, th I think all you can do is try and be honest. And that looks insane. Like when you're really trying to be honest, <sighs> yeah. you look like a crazy person. And, and you might end up evolving because you're being honest, right? Certainly. You I might change your mind and therefore to... you're going to start looking different. And that's yes. not because you're grifting. It's because you're changing your mind on things. Yeah. Are and you... we should change our mind on things. Yeah. Unless we know everything. But the SH, I... T word. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I'm okay. I think I'm okay with. I, I think you're I, more. You're open to swearing. I, I've gone back and forth with yeah. swearing a lot. Um, I guess here's my current. Speaking about being honest, right? Yeah, yeah. So my opinion might change next week. I'm currently at the position where I think to swear among friends. Yes. Uh, is acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. But publicly. Pub well, public I mean, it's also it's a bad business move. I I cop that. Like, I, well, I've, I've publicly because I'm unaware of the people I'm engaging. Yes, and also I, th yeah, I think it would be better I, if none of us swore. I think it'd be better. And I, it, it, why the, does it feel so good then, Matt? Because it's cathartic. It's a yeah. release. This I don't. Sometimes people use it to police working class people. Mm, interesting. Uh there's definitely like a way in which when rich people are, have a potty mouth and they're having a good time of it and they're doing Happy cocaine. Oh, get out, show. get out. Thursday's <laughs> not in this room anymore. He better be. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can go out there and give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> this is a surprise. Well, we, can we take this over? I've been looking for you. I've been looking for you. Can sure? celebrate just how great your producer is? We, we already did that. You did it already. Yeah. Can we take another moment? Do you know that you're on the air? You sure? should be aware before you say anything. You know, are these CDs on? They're yeah, all on. You <laughs> <laughs> Thursday, happy birthday! Not coming here. Donuts you know, and beer. It's I would love well, it. you know, it's 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 still the morning. Is that a little Debbie? Time for this. Where are you? Where are Get, you? Drop, drop some of these off and then All right, go sit go. go sit with Thursday. Well, I need we need the cut because I don't think he's had a little Debbie before. No, I've had their ice cream. I went to Walmart and I immediately had the little Debbie's ice cream Look of the this. honey bun. They're really oh, large. they're tiny. 
Look, you, 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 you can use this to cut it in half if you need if you need to cut it in half like this. Is that That's the knife you used to protect you yourself on the Steubenville Street? Please, please, please. There it is. Here, have that again. Stop it. Yeah, yeah. Here, have this. Don't worry, it's only. Is this planned? This was not planned. No, I love yeah, it. There Thank you. Go. All right, I love you guys. So <laughs> love much. you too, brother. You want to take a beer out with you? <laughs> no, uh, no, 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 no. Are you free no, no, today? Jacob, are you free today? Um, no, I'm not. But I love you very well, much. Well, can I just come to your tomorrow. house and pay I'm my respects tomorrow. to your young family? Here, I got you. What's that? <laughs> can I just drive to your house and pay my respects to your family? Please. Right. Yeah, they're a great family. They should have respect. What were we saying? Comedy. Words like... Jacob, do you think uh, swearing is used to control and police the working classes? Um... He's yeah, saying. I mean, most most of the time, when you he's try also, and destroy yeah. categories mm. for people, the, that's ways in which you limit their ability to reason through a society. I'm okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to say that. Mm? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at that. But okay, so here's here's something people say a lot of the time, and I can't tell if it is a cope, yes, or if there's truth to it. And we're going to get a ton of this in the comments section because mm -hmm. it's like the first thing everybody says, right? Which is it takes a lot more skill to be funny without swearing. Is that true? And if yes, why? If no, why? I mean, it takes a lot of skill to be funny. Full stop. Yeah, there are like ten people doing it well being in funny. the world being funny. Yeah, and I, I so prize being funny. Yeah. Like, if I'm on stage and I'm thinking at a bit, and I can make it vulgar, and it's one percent more funny, you'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it every time. Um, I won't. I mean, I won't find it. I don't find it funny if it's like, you know, disrespectful to God, or in my understanding of what is disrespectful to God. Uh -huh. But if I find it funny, that's a feeling that I, and that's that's dangerous to go like, there's some feeling inside of me that I'm moving towards. There's some like conception of what comedy is, and sometimes you have to do things you don't want to do. It was a cold night in Adelaide where I had to pour a drink down my front. As a part of a bit, I was like riffing with the crowd. It's like, ah, oh, it's going to be funny when I pour the drink down my front. I don't want to do it. But I, at that point, I knew I would have to do this thing. Yeah. Didn't even want to. Just Later had in the to. show, uh, Shane Warne died. And oh. it's like, I, sh I don't want to talk about Shane Warne dying. For the show, I'm going to have to let these how people know you, Shane Warne's dead. How did you do that? It was at the end of the night. And I said, Shane Warne's dead, everybody. Get home safe. God bless you. Oh, okay, yeah. Because you don't want to be I making jokes about funny. Shane Warne no, on the day I of his love death. Shane Warne. Yeah, Australian hero. Yes. Despite his problematic no, I mean, life. I think possibly because of his problematic life, we got around him. I think if he was that good at bowling and he was a clean-cut guy, we wouldn't love him as much. I don't think that's true. You, know, you think everyone would have gotten around Shane Warne if, if he'd never if he, put that beer glass in his mouth? If, if, he wasn't committing oh. a, if he wasn't committing adultery on his wife all the time? Yes, I, absolutely. I don't think that's a plus. I think it would have been good if he didn't do that. Good. <laughs> Shane, Shane Warne is a leg spin bowler for Australia. Please. One of the best bowlers Australia's ever had. The extent to which the sport is separated out. Do you find it weird? I'll tell you what I find very mm. disgusting. Hit me, yeah. 2020 cricket. Yeah, it's revolting. It's horrible. Uh, you know what I find disgusting? Limiting a test match to five days. Have the ultra test. Yeah. People should just no, go No, we're not going to explain cricket. cricket. People can go look it up. Cricket is the greatest game on the career, planet. I'm a late stage career. I like love cricket. cricket. I, I never liked it as a kid. Yeah. I was very bad at it, and that probably oh, I helped. I cricket. I want to go back in summer just so I can... Just have cricket Just so again. I can sit down and watch a game for five days. But I hear that 2020... Okay. Tell people bowler in cricket is pitcher. Figure no. it out. Figure it out. Google it. Um, but I hear that... and. And I'm not going to explain all this Thursday before you ask me. I hear that 2020 cricket mm. is negatively impacting test cricket, that maybe the bats are being designed differently, that it's becoming a slog fest even in well, test matches. Well, the that British true? were trying. The English were trying to bring 2020 style cricket to is a test a match. Is there a revolt? With, I feel like... And we, we messed them up. What? How? We beat them yeah. with good, conservative, tedious Australian test match cricket. Praise God, here's what I was going to say. I feel like the revolt against 2020 and the pushback and the return to test cricket mm. is like the revolt against a sloppy Novus Ordo and the return to a traditional Latin mass. Embrace, which way, Western man? Which way? How, how many runs are you going to try and get over this over? Yeah. I, I mean, I know they're trying to open up markets and have money but and that baseball is taking over the Caribbean. Uh, screw baseball. Yeah. Cricket I mean, is I, so much better than I baseball. I enjoy that no. baseball is perfectly timed to get drunk. You have like one Bud Light 
per <laughs> innings, and then by the end you are having a great time and really caring but, about but it. I think Americans are pretty impressed when they realise a five-day game. One game takes and, five days. All right, if we're talking about sport, I sport and Catholicism came in at the same time. I ca- I, yes, I'd come back from Melbourne. I'd had a big breakup. I was having a terrible time, and I went within within a few months. I was at the Latin Mass and Crows football games. And it was like something about, I think yeah. I was atomized or looking for community or something. I can't and tell. I think it's more important to have the Catholicism than the football. Yeah. But it's also very important to have the football. Both. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I'm reading Cardinal Pell's prison diaries right now. It's awesome how much he talks about footy. He was a Richmond VFL. I believe that's right. He was a Ruckman. He was th- a big I guy. Think, I think that's right. We've got to talk about the way in which he's regarded in this country is so, I'm going to move that down. It's so different to how in Australia. Like, despite being exonerated by Seven the full judges. high court yeah, and so transparently being stitched up. Totally. Uh, the conventional polite opinion remains that he was a sexual monster who happened to get off on a technicality. Everywhere else in the world, people who aren't even that into, people who don't love the church go, yeah, that's obviously this true. seems that like a, a terrible, yeah. unjust thing to have happened to somebody. But they're, they're so emotionally invested in destroying him in Australia. Could you sum up what happened for folks who don't yet know what we're talking about? He was. Uh, we don't have to go into the details of what yeah, he was yeah. accused of. He, I mean, he was a he was a bishop for a, a long yeah, time. He Melbourne became the, City, he was conservative. I rem- very conservative. He was hated and he by was the, the media. public face of conservatism. Yeah, it was it was always him being brought out to make the point in the media, um, and people wanted him destroyed. And they, I mean, to some extent, they got him. They certainly got his reputation in Australia. But then he and then he was. Uh, like, in, the, the charge brought against him was insane. Uh, like, everyone who... There's a great Julia Yost article that was released in Australia the day before the trial started. I think it was the day before the trial started, because after the trial started, it was you were illegal to make any commentary about it. You just had to sit back and... Gosh. You know, they'd made their public case about it, and they'd had whole books released at slandering him, but you weren't allowed to defend him publicly after the trial started. And Julia Yost has this incredible article breaking down all of the allegations and going, none of this is possible unless this man, as well as being a paedophile, is a magician. Um, <laughs> does he have the skill of an acrobat to have done this in a public pool? Yeah. It's, uh, but the, the willingness to believe it and try and bring him down was astronomical. I, yeah, to this um, day. I, was, I remember going to the ABC when that was on and people are going, how dare anyone defend a convicted pedophile. How did, and then when he was no longer a convicted pedophile and totally exonerated, exonerated no one comes out and goes, sorry, sorry about that, everybody. I was uh, had a little too much faith in the Victorian High Court. Should have waited for the proper federal thing to get underway. I, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to have your reputation ruined in that way because you know that even your closest friends at some point are like, well, that's, I mean, anyone. We, I went we to, love I went to guy, a monastery and people wouldn't defend him. Yeah. Um, because also I, people in the left, you know, in the liberal soft wing of the church also had a lot of axes to grind. I hope he'll be a saint. I, I, pray yeah. for, I, I ask for his intercession regularly. That's good. I got to go and pray by his tomb when I was in Sydney and it was, I felt his paternal affection, I have to say. Man, I don't think they've started tearing down statues and plaques and things yet, but they will. I, it let, would be let them. A Let's little, rebuild A them. little mea culpa from some people in Australia would be nice. Mm. You know, just a little... Oh, seven zip in the high court? There is a very high chance that an innocent man is currently in prison? Can we, can we just acknowledge that it happened? But there's never any, you know, the COVID vaccine might say whether or not it's poisoning people. I don't know. Certainly not stopping them getting COVID. Could someone just come out and say, we exaggerated, we didn't know at the time? Something about being so bought into a narrative that you can't backtrack. So I never got the shot. My 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 folks did. They got all the boosters, and they kept you getting COVID. Australia. And Enjoy I would say I would say just gently, right? Because yeah. they they almost thought that. What, and, and this is no shame to my parents because they lived in a country that was yeah. brainwashing them. I think. But I said no. I'm not getting the shot, and neither are my kids. And yeah. they, they talked to us like this was really irresponsible. Then they kept getting COVID, and so I would passive aggressively be like, oh, I "Has that shot? Thought you had the shot coming for you?" Yeah, well, we're much better off with it than uh, isn't without that, isn't it. it. And, imagine and again, what would happen if I didn't have That's not to throw my folks under the bus. I do the same thing with with things I'm invested no, in. It's but just it's, it's such a psychological it's like when, reality. When Lisa has the rock that she sells to Homer, do you remember that bit mm. where she's like, she goes, "It's the fallacy of uh, you know, there are no. I, I have this rock, and there are no bears around." 
this is a bear stopping rock. And Homer goes, I wish to buy this rock. <laughs> I mean, you can't, you can't know what it would have been like had you got it and not had it. Yeah. Ah, I did. I got, I got both. I mean, you can tell in Australia that people were just doing it because the government made them. Because uh, how hard was it for you? Oh, I mean, I caved immediately. Oh, it's so one of my better stand-up bits. I was like, I held out two, three months longer than my friends. And then they said, you won't be allowed to go into pubs anymore. <laughs> get it, get it right in there. Um, but all my, the booster uptake in Australia was very low. Mm. So once there wasn't a government going, we're going to take your job away, people went, I don't really care about it. I'm young and I'm healthy. I'm going to be all right. Ah, excuse me. I didn't mean to get into that. I am still... So I, I really just any reckoning, any apology about yeah. some of the things people have said would be welcome. I really liked your COVID bit because you related to the audience and sharing that you got it. You weren't standing there preaching at them as someone who hadn't. Yeah. And yet in that little bit was a cool way of calling out some of the insanity that went on during that time. It's so nutty. I mean, we do... In what film is the, ter- is the government that's forcing people to do things standing up against a plucky bunch of rebels ever the good guy? Mm-hmm. Just, one, just one time where the Empire is the good yeah. team. Well, this is why... Um, what was that excellent uh, series? Maybe not excellent, but it was a good series. Um, Hunger Games. Yeah. I mean, that's kind no, of Hunger an Games example. You've got the, the elites who are all looking like crazy people and the ordinary people. I can't believe Hollywood made it. Yeah. To this day, when I see people on the just presenting the federal news, they all look like Hunger Games people. What did that say? Hold on. Thursday said the Empire is the good guys, and I stand by that. <clears throat> well, they keep going back to the Empire. It didn't make much sense in the new films. You get rid of the Empire, the Rebel Alliance emerges, and then what? The Empire comes back immediately? Right. Seems like there's demand for Let the me Empire. push back against the sex stuff again. All right. So I think I'm okay with... The talking about the sex stuff. Uh, well, I don't think... So I think that... I, I, I guess I'm, I'm open to the idea that swearing is okay among friends. Okay. All right? I'm open to that. Um, but I, I think there's a, you know, obviously there's differences in swearing, right? Like blasphemy is intrinsically evil, right? But then on the, on, on the other end, you've got maybe just kind of speaking off the cuff colloquially, whatever. Yeah. Somewhere in the middle, though, I think it's like vulgarity about that which is sacred. So to speak about that which is sacred in a way that's profane yes. seems to be a bad idea at all times for me. And so I would disagree with you there. And you, can I, but then there's when, a phraseology you particularly object to that I won't repeat about where well, a man that's one is allowed to. Yep. No need. Uh, um, but let me let me kind manifest of, yeah, his yeah. <laughs> an emission. Yeah, that's right. Um, but let me let me kind of push back against me, even though I still think I'm right. Somebody said in my interview with Shane Smith underneath, and if you're that fellow who commented, thank you for this. He pointed to Dante's Inferno, mm. which has some very intense things. Yeah, like here you go. Here's one of them. There was there was one penalty for one group of sinners where. You're shoved into the ground, and then someone's head is shoved into your asshole, and yes. then someone's shed head is shoved into his asshole. Human just, centipede is just yeah, yeah, stolen this that's idea. Right. Yeah, and so that's so. There's a sense in which he's getting his point across, but he's using kind of graphic language. I suppose. I mean, it's, mean? it's. I mean, can we talk about sex in any sense? Can we talk I, about well, sex that's vulgar in no, a way I mean, that you would we disagree with? I mean, we have to because no, we don't have. Oh to. well, I have to. No. I feel compa- I feel compelled to. It's such a sexualized society. If we were living in a in a different time where the things that were assaulting people were different. I mean, you could drive past a billboard and an OnlyFans girl has taken that out yeah. in the town square. I remember that in Perth. Really? And she's like, here's my DM. Shame. Here's how to get in contact with me. This is what my body looks like. Enjoy, gentlemen. But I don't know that how many ladies are signing but, but up for that. But you can make fun of that without getting in the sewer with her. I mean, I would love to get out of the sewer and I'm, I'm doing my best. Oh, so you are doing to- your best. Oh, like on a personal level. I mean, I... I think we would subscribe to the same same things are hurtful. But it sounded like earlier you were acts. trying to justify how you speak talking in, about sex? in stand-up. Yeah, but then yeah. it sounds like you're trying to get out of the sewer. So are you contradicting yourself or are you talking about two different things? I mean, I guess I have such a low idea of my ability to make people sexually inflamed. I don't think of myself. That, maybe, maybe that's, that's not wrong. it. No? Yeah, that's not it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm I don't saying think when you speak people. about that which is reverent in yes. a crass way, you're degrading that which is... Reverend. Yeah, maybe I. I think there's a chance for that, and I think. I remember I, I once had big pushback from a lefty, like a pink hair, short head woman who you didn't know, like something that I had said about sex, where I was describing the sex act between a man and his wife. Uh-huh. Uh, but she, she said, "I find that disrespectful that you would talk about sex that way." But this, I mean, they have the veneer of speaking about sex in a nice, positive way, but actually, all the acts that these people are doing are, are terrible. 
And so what I, one of the things I like about vulgar language and that which is vulgar is like common and over the people is you get to, I wouldn't say it's a closer thing to reality, kind but of meet it, them it's, where they're it, at it, it sweeps away the pretext and the euphemism. And you actually, I mean, like, what is masturbating? Because people will talk about masturbating like it can be a beautiful thing and pornography is absolutely fine and things can be tasteful and erotica and you go, I just want to dispense with that. I want to cut through that quickly, you know? Yeah. Maybe the kind of erotica you're watching is nice and lovely and gentle. It's not, not the kind that I was being exposed yeah. to. Real quick, um, who was that comedian I shared with you? He has um, You Made It Awkward podcast. Ah, yes. I... I know. Can you look that up Thursday? Uh, anyway, Pete Holmes. Pete Holmes. Pete Holmes. That's yeah. it. Okay. So he's got a great bit at the end of his Netflix special. Yeah. And and uh, I don't. Yeah. He said something like, "Well, you know, you, people might be against homosexuality, but they're not against masturbation. But mm. if you're masturbating, you're yeah. a guy. You're, you're giving it's, a hand job to a guy. This is and you're receiving a hand job from a guy, which makes you double gay. Yeah. Like that. Well, I like. how gay masturbating is is a I, I guess question, I like that. I so maybe yeah. I'm a hypocrite there because I, I think he, there's a point being made there, but it's not a point that puts images in your mind or degrades the sexual act because you're showing why it's perverted. <laughs> I mean, I'm also. Is he going out of shot? The context Thursday? that I, I work okay. in is as a nightclub comedian, and I think the internet is is quite a bad. And I want to stop putting clips up as much because it's not helpful. Sometimes you, you put up a reel or something yeah. and it's like, can I build, can someone watch this and can I have a career? Can I go and club in places? Yeah, but when, yeah. when people are having a couple of drinks and they're smoking and they're talking and it's a relaxed atmosphere, um, I think there is a way of speaking that is appropriate to that environment. And that's what I work in as a comedian. Now, whether or not that will exist in a better society or whether we'll have to shut those rooms down, I don't know. Yeah. And we might have to. Let we me, might have to get we might have to get rid of the playhouses Cromwell style. I got to follow up. <laughs> yeah, and I also want to point out that in this conversation, you have compared yourself to the hero of the working class, and then compared me to the pink haired lady <laughs> who's a prudish. I'm just saying that there's a lot of stuff going on at all times. Um, but what would be? I do think of myself as a hero of the working class. <laughs> I do too. In 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 your mind, would there be a way to speak about sex in a way that you would find inappropriate from stage? Yes. That's, that's still funny. That would be uh, would be inappropriate. Yeah. That you wouldn't do because you're like, no, that's wrong, and I wouldn't do that. Like I've got jokes about uh, pornography that I don't <laughs> say, that I've thought of that are funny. Okay. I think funny jokes about pornography, and I may say them at some point. But so I why wouldn't you say them right now? Because uh, I'm so against pornography. Like I, I just really don't like it. Yeah. Um, but there's also. There's a truth to speaking of the struggle, right. you know, what pornography does to a person, how it, get, how it gets in, uh -huh. where it's like, I think that can be helpful to do an account of this is why someone does something. Uh -huh. I mean, just to, to take masturbating. I remember I, I once confessed masturbating and the priest, he said something that I didn't think was right. He was like, because you want control or something. Uh -huh. He was like, oh, you're doing that because you want to control a woman or something. And I thought, that's not it at all. I, I want to relieve my anxiety and have a yeah. a more relaxed afternoon or something. But then the more I think about it, the more it's like, ah, yeah, it is. I mean, the relief of that anxiety is a kind of disordered control. It's saying I'm going to take literally my pleasure into my hands mm -hmm. and um, or some sort of robot or whatever they're doing out there now. And it's like if you actually address the deep, dark, weird psychological things happening towards that, you can combat it a bit. Like, you have to address it. I think you have to know what it is that you're up against. And so I would – I like exploring that in my comedy because I, yeah. I find it very funny. Yeah. And also that, man, people will go masturbating's fine. And even they'll go to the extent that pornography is bad. But, yeah. like, if it's you and your thoughts, that's okay. How could that possibly be wrong? That doesn't hurt anybody else. And so to explore that, well, why is that wrong? Yeah. Why is it, why is something that actually doesn't, you know, it's just impacting me here. Why do I have to treat myself with a certain level of respect? Why do I, you know, yeah. I don't have a bit about that at the moment, but there's like, there's a conflict there that I'm trying to unpack. Yeah. And I don't, I don't have an easy, clean way of talking about that. What, what I'm trying to figure I out. I also don't want to go dirty while I'm talking about all these No, please don't. Things. But what I'm trying to figure out, make it what easier. I'm trying to figure out though, is if you think there's a way to speak about sex that would be immoral from a stage. That's what I'm trying to ask you. Oh yeah. Like when, and when I don't, people. I don't want you to give no, me I examples think, of it, but I'm trying well, to figure out. When people glorify abortion. 
right? When people glorify pornography, uh, pornography yeah. uh, this I find, well, it's just like unthought through. Like, I don't think, like, I don't talk think it's about, like it's a good idea. Or yeah, like oh, how that. wonderful abortion has liberated me from having to have kids, and you'll get a laugh from an audience if oh, you say that. I see. Okay. Um, but it has to come back to what is true, and like really, the only light that you can have for writing or thinking or talking to someone or recognizing what is true in the world. And the thing that got me into Catholicism was going, I think this is true. I'm going to test this a bunch of different ways. I think this is correct mm. and so pursuing that however ugly and strange that is i mean it's it's an ugly and strange fallen world in which we're in and i think the art should sometimes reflect that okay that's good I, and i think pete holmes joke about masturbation mm. might convert more people to not masturbating than say christopher west who they've never heard of so yeah, yeah. there's a way that you can kind of <laughs> infiltrate and and point out things not in a kind of sly way. That's well, not what no, I mean. but also I think that's so. F I mean, this is this is a failing with me is that that's beyond my skill, and I should think about it more often because you're a, you're a public person doing comedy. Yeah, but I find it really hard to think about what I'm doing and how that would influence another person's life. Um, and I guess that's you're not a preacher, so the your, the point of your comedy. Isn't I don't to think anyone. I'm a very bad Catholic. Like I'm a great sinner. I'm, I, I don't think I, at this point, would be a... I aspire to sainthood. I'm doing good, my best. Good. But I don't think under anyone's scope, if I was hit by a bus today, they'd be going, it's James McCann and Pell. These are the big two. Like, I don't I don't want people to emulate me in that way. I'm yeah. doing my best. But Debussy has that line about, I don't care if my music makes people think it would be enough to make them listen. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to be funny. Yeah. And you are uh, very, very funny. Well, but that's well, that's very kind, and sometimes I fail at that as well. But really, that's my sole fixation: is trying to be funny. And it, if I find it untruthful, I think it would lead people to do something, to have an impression about something being true, being not true. I mean, that's not fun. Yeah, that's not to lead people astray is not good. But also, if it's something, if it's something that I would say with my friends vulgarly in a pub, I do want to share that with everybody. That is the mode that I would like to interact with from the stage for people. So I know the fella who runs VidAngel and uh, Angel Studios and they have Dry Bar, right? Yeah. Please God, let's see, maybe he's watching, if I can get you in touch with him and he asked you to do a Dry Bar special, would you feel comfortable doing that given the yes. parameters they give you? I don't know what their parameters well, are. Well, you know, no, no swearing, no sexual jokes, I'm like working, I think I could do a good 10. Yeah. <laughs> I think I could do an excellent 10 minutes. It's also, it's so hard for me to generate material. Like... It takes so long to... So this comedy special you did in Austin, was that a new... A lot I, just, of new I, was jokes doing, I was doing 10, 15. But was it new jokes I you did had a, I got a couple new ones about... I may, maybe over that week, I managed to get a new minute. Yeah. Um, like that's... Yeah, a minute a week is a good... Is it? That's a good week. Yeah. Have you... Oh. What? Tell us about the time you bombed. Well, ever, a lot. <laughs> it's not just one time. I bomb all the time. Tell us about the most epic time you bombed on stage. It was a corporate gig for Cheap as Chips. Okay. It was their Christmas show. This is like a dollar store in Australia. It's FYI. a dollar store. Uh, the reject shop would be the equivalent. I don't know. They don't even have that. Yeah, yet. like Dollar Tree. It's a Dollar Tree. And I was, it was, the room was so badly set up for comedy. I was behind a lectern. Trying to do comedy behind a lectern is, <laughs> I didn't know how bad that would be. And all the lights were on and people were eating their meals. Oh. And I, man, I, even a worse one I did earlier this year, I was doing another corporate for a disability company. Uh oh. And um, <laughs> I think I opened with something like, man, I thought there'd be more disabled people working for this company. Uh, it was excellent. It was just something. No, they didn't like it. They, they were I'm having sure a, they were having a casino night. I was interrupting them playing blackjack. <laughs> and then I'm like in a dark corner with a tinny microphone trying to shout about the price of bread at people. And no, how, there's a lot of bad gear. I took the money and I ran. How long was that gig for you? Like, it was meant to be 20. I think I gave them 13. I was out. Yeah. Pronto. No, there's a lot of bad gigs. Oh, there's a lot of bad gigs. And how do you handle that? Psychologically, what does it do to I you? I walk the streets and I look <laughs> at walls. It's a really <laughs> bad time. No, after doing badly on... I mean, you're so, you've just tried to make people happy. Yeah. And you've failed. And they've all looked at you. And maybe one or two people had a nice time. You don't want to talk to them. You just want to go and be alone and... Ah, I, I'm shocked that people who are, some people who are really bad at comedy keep going. I can't imagine 
if I bombed more than once every now and then, also you can time the bombing because you you know where the bad gigs is likely to be and where the new material is going to be at, and it's the fortitude you have. Am I am I ready to have a bad day? I'll do the new five minutes. Yeah, because it's going to ruin the day, and it's, I'm going to come home and it's going to wreck every. I'm not going to be able to be kind to my children. I'm going <laughs> to sit alone. It's very. It's. Uh, yeah. Do you have someone you call to process that? A, a number of comedians on the phone. When yeah, we talk about that, must be helpful. Yes, I am not a comedian. I wouldn't be good as a stand-up. But I gave a talk in Sydney recently with Jason Everett. So yeah. Jason gets up first. There's like a thousand people in the stands. They're all teenagers, and he crushes it because he's mm. one of the best presenters ever. And then I have to get up and give my talk, and it was awkward. The people were far back. There was a big space yeah. in the middle. As I started, some teenagers were kind of messing around. Yeah, the teacher yeah. was dealing with them. Get I, on the phone to Scott Hahn immediately. I, Scott, <laughs> what do you do? He's like, I've never bombed. I had to give a forty-five. I, I possibly believe that. I had to give a forty-five minute talk. I think it was over in twenty minutes because it was terrible. Yeah, the sweat on the back and starts. It, to and it was in. the kind of terrible that when people go, "No, I wasn't that bad." You're like, "Shut up!" Yeah. I'm telling you, don't lie to me. It was the worst. If you lie to me now, I will never trust uh, you when you say I did well. It was awful. I mean, at least with a the talk, there's a wiggle room where you can go, some people may have felt one way about this, some people may have felt the other. When people do poetry, I'm always, or like music, you know? It's like, here's my art, I'm presenting it to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't like it, well, that's maybe that's on yes, you. Yes. But when you're really talking to people and you're trying to get everyone to laugh at the same time or something or, or trying to convey a point to them, you can tell when it's not. Landing, and it's always your fault. If you're presenting a talk or doing a comedy thing, it's not that they didn't connect with you. Your job was to connect with them, That's and you right. failed. That's oh, right. excuse me. This is a hard place to be at on a cold Steubenville morning. Taken back to my darkest moment. What do you? Well, moving away from you, then. What do you see stand-up comics do that you're like? That's a bad idea. Or you see new stand-up comics, you're like, ah, this is how they. This is what they shouldn't um, be doing. Men and women do it really differently when they okay. start out. Men, women, almost always over prepare. Okay. And then it's like a version that they've read in the mirror. So there's no uh, given the joints kind of thing. It's very yes. scripted. <clears throat> and it feels offensive to the audience because you're, you're disrespecting them by not being present with them and just going through as though everything is going well. And then they, they start to lose confidence, but they keep delivering it in a confident way and their eyes start to panic and you go, oh, this is, this is very bad. Men will start out and they'll maybe – vibe with the audience more but they they haven't put in the work they haven't prepared anything and it's just you're just uh messing around and that too is disrespectful and so i think eventually both they synthesize women get looser and men get more prepared yeah there's also men who do the effeminate thing of preparing too much and like repeating their lines in the shower or something because the way you, you want to just be yeah with you're already there it's like a good conversation. Is you tell me? Is it like a good conversation? Yeah. Like if I had scripted my conversation with you and it we sat weird, down, right? And I had to get through a list of things. Yeah. Even did you if you're see not the Did you see the Cat Williams interview recently no. with Shannon Sharp? It's a. It's I a, don't know who either of those people. It's are. a big interview that's blown up. But okay. he, Cat Williams is saying insane, like really weird. That he's going like this guy's Illuminati. I read three thousand books as a child every year. I was accepted into the university at twelve. And you go, none of this is. <laughs> it can't be true. And the guy's just like going through his questions and oh, going to the next one yes. for four hours. And you go, are you, are you listening to the things that this man is? Are you going to challenge that he just said as a child he read 3,000 books a year? No one can read three. You can't yeah. read 100 books a day. Yeah, get your calculator out, divide that. How many? Just do a little math. Th Thursday, how, how many books? 3,000 divided by 325. Very close to 100 a day. I'm going to say 87. Yeah. I'm going to say 87. 8.2? 82. Oh, I was close. But also, I mean, it's it's hard to be present, right? Like, it's one of the most difficult yeah, well, this things. Is hard. Yeah, I don't know how you do long podcasts. I keep my podcast to 30 minutes because I am tired at the end of it. But when you, do, you do what? Three-hour conversations we'll with people when you try to stay present. I love it. How do you, I mean, how do you keep listening the whole time? What do you? By actually being interested. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're also picking good people to... Being excellent people today. Yeah. But you can pick people you want to talk to. Yeah. But if you had to talk to someone who was being chosen, you know. Here's, here's what I would find difficult. If I had someone come on and they wanted to speak about a narrow topic, like the, here's what I'm here to talk about. Yeah. Very narrow. Like even, you know, and, and then I had to kind of stick to that. And ha even though I wanted to go in different directions or I got bored. It's yeah. kind of one of the nice things about this is, you know. You can just go anywhere. We've talked about all sorts of things and we just keep going like a conversation. Like conversations yes. aren't tiring. 
But if you have a conversation yeah. with somebody who's not interested in you, you stop having a conversation with them. And I really, yeah. I am interested in you. And I, I love these people that come and sit here. I'm genuinely interested in them. That's what Thanks. a touch. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <clears throat> Who do, I mean, I think the best person to interview would be Kanye because he's the most present, well, attentive you can help person. With that. After you get Shane Gillis on the show, see if you can get I don't know, I don't know where Kanye. he's at. I don't know where Kanye's at. He's now dating an Australian woman mm. who I know. So I now know Kanye's wife by one degree. And I think oh, yeah. that counts as his wife because I'm pretty sure that was not a valid marriage to Kim Kardashian because she was divorced four times. Don't know. I think you'd need a, there's a lot of paperwork to figure out whether or not he's currently <laughs> validly married, but. So he's, ma he's married to an Aussie? He's married to an Aussie. Really? And he tried to visit, apparently he tried to visit her family in Australia and we won't let him in now. Bloody because Australia. Unpleasantness. Kanye has appeared to fall away from the faith. Yes. Has he? That's a shame because that that album about Christ was so moving t to me and and so excellently done. I think they're all about Christ. I really? mean, Jesus is King is the big yeah. That's what I, that's what I meant. That, that, that album. He's was I think a good example of someone who's like he's really the album before that, the Life of Pablo, where he's I don't know. He's really thinking about it's uh, on the front cover. It's Life of Pablo, and that's which one? He's like Pablo Escobar and Saint Peter, and like who who is he being? Who is he aspiring mm. towards? And he got really he got angry that people. Didn't help him be a good Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yay was before Jesus. Yeah, I mean, Yay was also a great album. But he's, I mean, Kanye is an obvious example of someone who is struggling, not only with his own mental health, but he yeah. really cares about what the truth is. Okay. Um, and the hard thing is, is that it's also, I think it's also easy to get yourself to believe that all pleasure is true. Yeah. Do you know, like... Hedonism, is that what you mean? Hedonism, yeah. yeah. I mean, because hedonism is, it's at least real. Yeah. It's at least like... Great Chesterton poem about if I was a pagan, all the things I would do, I'd, I'd be, yeah, you know, pillaging my way across Europe and having a wonderful time. And yet, you, you people who are not Christian, what are you just going to sit and read a book quietly in the evening? What are you doing? That reminds me of a talk. Some uh, Peter Kraft has this story about a fellow who is from Russia. He got up and he, it was like an address to college students, and he said, uh, "You, uh, you Americans are boring." Mm. He says, "We, we Russians are wicked, but we're interesting." <laughs> yeah, and uh, I often think of that when we, uh, our, even our sins are boring. You know, like I want to masturbate. Sure. You love this. You love that. Is it Shane with the tattoos? He's doing a bit on that. If I had been a heathen, I'd have praised the purple vine. My slaves should dig the vineyards, and I would drink the wine. But Higgins is a heathen, and his slaves grow lean and grey, that he may drink some tepid milk exactly twice a day. If I had been a heathen. How long is this poem? <laughs> if I, I had been a heathen. I want you to keep going. I'd have crowned Naedra's curls and filled my life with love affairs, my house with dancing girls. But Higgins is a heathen, and to lecture rooms is forced, where his aunts, who are not married, demand to be divorced. Scroll down. If I had been a heathen, I'd have sent my armies forth and dragged behind my chariots the chieftains of the north. But Higgins is a heathen, and he drives the dreary quill to lend the poor that funny cash that makes them poorer still. If I had been a heathen, I'd have piled my pyre on high and in a great red whirlwind gone roaring to the sky. But Higgins is a heathen and a richer man than I, and they put him in an oven just as if he were a pie. <laughs> he's, he's done a lot better Keep going. in this. Now who that runs can read it, the riddle that I write of why this poor old sinner should sin without delight but i i cannot read it although i run and run of them that do not have the faith and will not have the fun isn't it lovely it's like that monty python bit where the protestant comes home to his quiet wife and he goes the, the catholic cannot you know have sex with you i could i could have sex in all sorts of interesting ways and his wife goes will you do it and he goes oh, not really i'm not really interested <laughs> it's a good point did you oh. Did you, did you, I know you said that you were conservative, at least economically prior to your conversion. Did you have a change in regards to sexual morality? Or since you were already a nominal Protestant, maybe you held to some of those things? Well, I was I was fairly sure that the things I was doing were, not, were wrong in some yeah. way. It's hard to convince yourself it's not, isn't it? I was an agnostic until I, I was I 17 ever managed to and think I knew it wasn't. was wrong. Yeah. I knew it was wrong because I remember after hooking up at a girl at some party, I would find myself trying to justify it in my oh, sleeping yeah. bag, you know, half drunk. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, don't tell me. That's fine. That's fine. I yeah. didn't hurt her. It's fine. <laughs> but no one has ever said that at a soup kitchen, feeding the poor. Don't tell, don't be telling me I'm not bloody hurting anybody. Yeah. You don't say that when you know that what you're doing is right. I mean, Anscombe has a line about sex where I think she's like, 
walking through a mu- walking through a forest and picking up a mushroom and eating mm-hmm. it. Sex is never like that. Like sex is yeah. always weird and complicated. Yeah. And you don't really you can say that it's not. It's just a mechanical. Yeah. You know, a very friendly handshake. Yeah. But I think if you pay any attention to them. No, it's insane. I remember hearing a woman say, oh, what's the problem? It's just like a massage. But then there's so many follow-ups to that that would insult her. Like, Not okay, the ones well, that I was having, yeah. You know, like, well, what if somebody massaged you or your mm. daughter? And without, Maybe it's a very you know, specific kind of massage that this yeah, person is describing. It's, it's insane. It's insane. I am loving that they're in America. Man, Australia is so full of handjob parlours. Are you serious? Oh, every every block, every You're street me. corner. I think because we've got a lot of what are they people called? from Asia. How do they sell them? It used to be like massage with a blocked out thing and a big oh, flashing yeah. open light out. But it's every Mercy. like it's everywhere, yeah. and it's just not an American thing. And well, no one in Australia will really. I mean, it's like maybe it is. I don't know. I haven't. No, I mean it's like in terms of public facing street frontage. You go. It's not. Uh, I'm. You know. I'm not because I mean. Having to walk past a sexual massage parlor, you, you, it's, you know, ah, thoughts go in the mind. It's difficult. It's an act of the will to walk through the street. It's just so nice to have a family friendly. And I say this doing very dirty comedy all the time that I'm sure you make a good point about. But it's just, it's so nice to think you can get, you can get rid of that, you know, which is not to say that Steubenville is without prostitutes. Yeah. Uh, although in the cold, I'm not seeing anybody. <laughs> The snow is when full I, on. When I first moved here, I uh, thought I encountered a prostitute, but I didn't, apparently. <laughs> so I'm walking out the front doors, and this questionable-looking woman yeah. came up to me, and rather than me engaging her in a lovely Christian conversation, yeah. I went, no! He's ran away. I went, no! And walked away. I think she was a professor at, student, at Franciscan. I had the opposite I'd like to apologize to this I, woman. I was in King's Cross, and a, just a, a very normal-looking woman in, like, a tracksuit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How, she wasn't even how are you doing? And I was like, I'm doing really well. Thank you so much. Said, how are you doing? She said, would you like sex? Would you, uh, would you like, I think God, she was like a hero. Yes. And I was like, ah, I mean, not right now. <laughs> Look, I'm going home. Have you heard Carl Barron's bit about that? No. No, thanks. I'm feeling good today. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because it's when a man is low that he's looking for, it's not like, ah, yeah, yeah. I'm feeling good today. So that's not necessary. Yeah. If he was having a bad day, maybe the answer is different. He's, I've never met Carl Barron and almost no one in Australian comedy has met him. What do people say about him in the comedy scene in Australia? That he's great, but where, where, is, where is he? He just does his theatre shows. Do you think he was like that when separate. he began, but he's so big now that he doesn't need to hobnob? Even older people who've been in the comedy scene for a he long time. He seems like a massive intro- introvert, doesn't, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. I mean, that's the dream, right? You just you show up, you do your theatre gig. Yeah, you're good enough. You go home, you read your poetry. He's very funny. You know who else is very funny is mm. Jim Owen. Jim Owen's great. But see, see, with Jim Owen, I legitimately find him hilarious when he's not being sexual because he has such a beautiful, charming yeah. demeanor that when he gets sexual, it, kind of, it feels gross to me because yeah. he's no, he's like my, he's like the charming, innocent brother. And then when he starts getting dirty, I'm like, I, I really, I don't think that's good for you. <laughs> Well, it may not be good in people's personal lives and things reflect yeah. out. But I, I haven't think Is about, he still going? He's still going. Like I, when it I came out, when it came out that Louis was masturbating in front of people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this shouldn't have come as a huge shock to anyone, I think, yeah. who was following his work. Right. Like he was fairly transparent about who he was and where he was at. And people tried to... He was, But he also... I mean, he's a chronic masturbator. Is he? Oh, but he, I mean, he talks about it all the time in his work, but then he also talks about being a loving father, and that's true as well. And so there's like some... Yeah, veil. You know, he was a complicated person representing that on stage, but this is why it's also nice to have a... I think See, comedy is say bad. complicated and not just say shameful? Like that's, it's not like he's, well, he's complicated I mean, being and that a makes him father interesting. Is, is good. He'd be way more interesting if he cut out the masturbating. Yeah. Man, it'd be interesting. Because I love your point earlier about the pre saying you're trying to control, and I do think that is. I think the reason people engage in sexual sins is very broadly because it's soothing and we seek yeah. to soothe our emotional turbulence, which is why you're having a good day. You, you know, yes. You're right. And so there's a way to regulate that doesn't involve mortal sin. Hit that up. Well, yeah, there is. And it's, I went to the, I went to the holy hour last night mm. and uh, I can't tell you how I was, I was still pretty angry when my baby kicked me in the chest at uh, <laughs> four in the morning. But when did you go to, Holy hour. Oh, eight? So before the incident with the chest yeah, yeah, kicking, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think I, I, I was in a much better mood yeah. for having been to the holy hour. But that, like, you you can get it. It's not like it's not the immediate gratification, right? But there is. I mean, there are. 
I don't want to. I don't want to go. I keep wanting to say dirty things, but I mean, here are two different ways that a man who's feeling terrible can get on his knees and try and do something to save himself. Right. And the prayer prayer doesn't always make you feel good immediately. Yeah. I mean, you can just have. I had a terrible yeah. first forty minutes Com- compare of just sitting to, in the cold at the holy hour. Compare it to eating healthy and mm. exercising. Like the donut feels a lot better, but then you feel awful. And afterwards. I didn't. Well, I still feel pretty good having <laughs> that little Debbie's donut. <laughs> I said forty minutes. It's afterwards. it's so good. It's yeah. We'll see how it kicks in later. Yeah, I mean, I want to tell people about what prayer has done for me. What has prayer done for you? Well, I mean, just immediately last night, I was a much happier. I walked into that holy hour angry and wet and cold. Yeah. And uh, I was I was going to the Speedway to buy a Stella or a Trois because I've had a gut full of these just nothing American beers. And I walked out of there happy, uplifted, pleased to have my Stella or a Trois a little later on. But like... yeah. Also to have that respected by my wife that I'm going off to to just have an hour away yeah. and it's a good thing to do for our marriage to spend that time. I mean, it's very, if you've got young children and you, and you go, honey, I need to go away. That's sort of, it's a betrayal in some sense. You're saying, I'm going to force you to. I'm going to leave you with these kids. You're at the coalface. You're having a hard time. But uh, man, I would, I, I, I'm going to try and take the kids today and send her for a holiday, to do a holy hour every day. Yeah. Fulton Sheen, I read a, his autobiography, and he writes about how that was like the most transformative thing in his life. I, I like to think, I pridefully think of the virtues that I might be able to unlock mm-hmm. if I spend more time at prayer. And not just like, he's yeah, just like real, dedicated, solitary. It's so nice. It's so good that they have 24 hour, 24 hour adoration. It's, ah, uh, oh. yeah, we don't have 24-hour adoration in Adelaide. And it's quite rare to find it I would think somewhere. that if your SS, uh, sorry, FSSP parish started it, that you would fill that up. I think we're probably at a point where we could do it, and they, do, they run a lot of, like, 40 hours throughout the year. Mm-hmm. But also then I'm, like, such a selfish person. I, I almost never helped to, you know, I've never volunteered to be the person there yeah. helping with it. And it's... It's always these lovely boomers who, you yeah, know, put in the, the time. together. Yeah. Well, what's nice about where you're living now is just a quick walk. That's a lot easier than getting to a car and driving for 20 minutes. Negative 12 degrees Celsius is, <laughs> it, 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 it does creep in. The cold does. Uh, is this the first time you've seen snow? Ever? Yes. Yeah. Well, I saw a little bit in New Zealand once, but proper snow. This is the first. What was that like? Time. It was magical for a moment. And then my <laughs> father took my son out. And they were away for seven minutes and I was like, is my son getting hypothermia? We don't have the proper gloves because we've been. Yeah. I'm getting a car today, but we've been carless in. Oh, you are getting a car. I, I am. I found a Toyota Camry that I'm going to try and buy. I think I can afford. It's okay. going to fit everybody in it. Man, I, I, I didn't think I could get a social security number before I came to America. So I, you, know, you have to be here and go to the office was my understanding. You can't open a bank account without that. Yeah. Uh, I can't cash checks from gigs to put into a bank account without that it takes two weeks for the social security number to come through so just like yeah in the least walkable place in the world I'm, i can i can get to the speedway to buy booze and petrol don't need the petrol <laughs> and i can get to the church and that's it that's that's within walking distance right. and i feel like i'm asking everyone for help i'm like trying to i'm borrowing people's cars yeah. but we love I'm, it uh, we love it but it People, people are, people are being you. extremely good about it, but it is so hard to be in that position of a child of like... Yeah, but we've all... I mean, I, I really say this in full truth. Honestly, we've all been there. Mm. When I moved to Steubenville, Jakey B. Mom was doing finishing, who just showed up earlier for those watching. He was still doing his doctorate in Oxford and he had to go for three months and he said, please have our house. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, obviously we'll pay you rent. It's like, I refuse to let you pay me rent. I mean, I keep feeling that it's got to run out. This is the other thing. Like, I, you, I have to get better at it. And I love it when people do it for me and they let me help them and give them lifts when I have a car. And I think, I I think, very, people out. I think very often people prefer giving charity than receiving it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, re- it's, right, I'm, I it's hope awkward, to be eh? getting better at receiving charity, but yeah. it is. I often say if I, if I, if I offer somebody a gift and they seem reluctant to take it, I'll say, if you can't take this, you'll never be able to receive Christ's death on the cross. Well, so I, I shame them into taking it. And telling myself to say that. But then at some point you're also like, I mean, I'm living next to Mark and his wife, yeah. and they also need their car for some things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, like, sure, sure. oh, some of the things I, I also I don't. I'm getting better at driving on the correct American side of the road, <laughs> but I'm aware that I'm a risk. Yeah, and so I'm asking people to entrust me with that. And like every time someone is going out driving with me, 
you know, in order to get me naturalized to their roads, for me, it's quite a small thing. I'm getting better at driving. For them, it's like potentially their livelihood is their car, and I'm aware yeah, that yeah, I keep yeah. asking for this big, strange thing. It is, man, it'd be nice to have some public transport in Steubenville. Yeah. Public transport is great. I'm, I yeah, used to it hate is. it. I rode the bus all it the is. time. Well, I in hated Australia, being on the it's bus. nice, but in America, yeah. you will get beheaded. <laughs> oh, I've had a couple of dark nights of the soul. I remember yesterday before the holy hour, I was just lying in bed going, kill me, God. Kill, like there was an intrusive, I was just lying there going, just mm. if, if I can go to heaven now, just take me out. Kill me now. And then later on I came back from the holy hour and I thought, please don't kill me. Yeah. Please let me be alive for my family. But it's like, well, it is, it's you, living on the, it, being the immigrant experience the is immigrant experience, full on. We should also point out to people who don't know, you, you moved here like a week ago. Yes. Moving is actually, I really think it's traumatic. Mm. I, yes. And coming into a new place is, has its own difficulties. Coming to a new place in the middle of winter like there are so many things you're going through. I felt the same oh. way when I when I moved to Steubenville. I actually think I hit a big depression for a long time. I was not. Ha I was in a bad place. Yeah. My wife and I look at photos of the two of us just several months before we moved, and we aged terribly. There was so much stress that hit us. I had a. I tried to get into a bar in Austin, and I didn't have an ID. And the woman said, "Have you got any greys?" <laughs> and I did it, and I was like, "Yeah, I got a big chunk." Because the last getting through the U.S. immigration system is, uh it's not, they keep saying they want people to come here legally. They do nothing to make it easy for people to come here legally. What they, obviously what they want is you to walk across the border and... That's it. Yeah. Which I thought about a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fly down to Mexico. Just, make your way up. Oh, I'll trudge down from Canada. I'll have to go the, I'll go the upper class way. Yeah. The la da way to illegally immigrate. Man, to be through it is lovely. When I got that visa and the passport, I was... Which was also weird, like I, it's it's so like high and official the whole time, right? And you've it's so many forms to fill out and if you make a mistake, you feel like yeah. your life is over totally. and you've got to fill out all these forms for your kids. And I've got to say, you've got to declare that your children have never committed a genocide <laughs> or plan to, and you, and also they're like, the every person doing this must sign it. Yeah. And you go, okay, but he's one. So like my son is here on a visa. How... Uh, Obviously, he's not going to sign it. I'm going to be clicking it. And then you're afraid. If I admit to that, am I yeah. are you going to kick me out of the country yeah. when I admit that he's not a communist and has never been a part of the communist party? Yeah. Man. But, uh, but then when I actually got the visa, I got a phone call from people going, can you drive out to this suburban house to pick it up? And I just drove out and there was this Chinese lady out and her <laughs> dad is walking around the front yard. She's like, yeah, the visas are in the back. And you go, how, how are we running it? Like... <laughs> There's no consistency. It's it's almost like America's a different country. Very almost. similar. Very similar. It's I don't know about you, but I'm one of these folks who I find it difficult to see the forest from the tree in front of me. Yeah. So if I'm having a bad day or if my wife and I are at each other a little bit, in my mind, somehow that's what it's like forever. And I don't have the foresight to realize, yeah. okay, this is just a season and things will be better. How are you with that? Getting better. My wife is very patient. And what she has done is much stranger than what I have done. How so? Well, she's, we, you know, in Australia, we had a house. We had, we'd moved next to our neighbor, which I thought was a terrible idea at the time. She thought it was a good idea. My neighbor, Paul, who was reading New Polity and was a, a big, that's how I found out Steubenville existed. Wow. He said, you they should move into the house next to our house, which is, you know, two blocks from the, the Latin Mass Parish. And, uh, and I thought this is going to be like a sitcom and we're going to be at each other's throats and there's going to be all this trouble. And it was the best two years of my life was living in this, you know, they've got kids running around. We've got kids that are the same age and it's like, oh, this is a foretaste of heaven. This is like what community is meant to be like. Everybody should live in a walkable way yeah. to the people they love. Um, and so we had that and then she's given that up so that we can come here and I can do comedy in America. But, uh, man, I really, I Was mean, that she's difficult for her or is she excited about the adventure at some level? I mean, both, but it's, they're getting, people have been very inspired in our parish by the Steubenville project. In uh, Australia? Yeah. I wow. mean, people are starting up a school. Praise God. Uh, my friend Paul started a bar so that people could. Is that the one I went to? 
Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Earn Malleys. Earn Malleys. It's a beautiful bar. Yeah. So people have started up a magazine because yeah. at some point there's just like so many poets. I was shocked how showing good the magazine looks. Pre- sh- that's Margot Holbert. Yeah, please shout is, them out. Uh, it's can Agony they, Magazine. Can they get it online somewhere? They can get it online. She's doing it just like. Do you know the URL? It's excellent. Uh, I mean, Agony Space Magazine. Sometimes people give you something that they did and you're like, uh, yeah, this is fine. Thank you. But this was beautiful. She's Doing it, to, and then when I got to walk around the new polity office, and I'd felt guilty for being embarrassed to like I didn't send out a copy. Uh, I could have been like, "You've inspired us to make yeah, yeah, this yeah. magazine and try and build a town." With well, you had a lot going on, virtue. but they had it. Like I got oh. there, and they had already found out about it, and they were like, "Like we like this one a lot, and we like this one." And it's, you go, man, the fruits of community are real and beautiful, and they make life like so many of the things that we think, "Oh, having children is just hard." A lot of that is that we build a society that makes it unnecessarily hard. And the fact that we don't, I don't, I've got one brother. My wife has a half brother who lives overseas. You've got to have, once you, and then the second, third generation of big families and aunties can be there, like the power that an auntie can have in raising a family. A lot of the, when people are going, I'm burning out, I'm not sleeping. Really you're suffering from not having a sister who's there who can help you, I think. So every, I mean, but then in the community we've got that. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, this I mean, my sister's moving here in May with her husband. They've already bought a house. I'm so excited about that. And this is why I don't like when people disparage Catholic communities by calling them bubbles, because by bubble they just mean to live among friends in a community, which is just how humans have lived throughout all civilization. Yeah. So you should absolutely find a bubble. And by bubble, I don't mean insular cult-like where you don't no, go you should, out and You should find people 150 in. people and you all know each other. And that's where we are, And when man. you're in trouble, they can help you. And when they're in trouble, you can help them. I know you've only been here a week, but what is your impression of Steubenville having moved here? And oh, is when it you different? get into the downtown, it's magical. Once cr- crossing from the church... Oh, oh, move, oh, move. oh, I'm out of the camera. I apologize. Um, yeah, because you've got the cigar bar... And then that lovely bookstore, and then the bar, and it's like and I, more things are opening up. I was just I, I, Thursday. I saw, I saw you, and then randomly I saw Mark working at his grocery store. Yeah, and then like I walk across the road to the new polity thing, and I'm talking to all those people. And then when I saw Jacob for the first time, uh, he's just a beam of sunshine. Oh, he'd keep anyone going. Yeah, if they absolutely. Him. And it it's like I love Adelaide. It's a big town. It's very expensive. It's a beautiful and it's town. Quite hard to form a little catholic ghetto yeah it's not easy financially um but yeah i I, well i love it i love that well i tell you i've been waiting for an australian to move here because i am not the kind of fellow who can wake up at two in the morning to watch a crows match i'll do it but i would love to do it with you this is our year baby yeah you and my sister wouldn't that be great if we get together crows person she's big enough it'd be nice and nostalgic at the at the least you know it's such a. I'm really trying to understand the sport here are you i've been following the steelers all year just because i thought that would be like a good yeah Kind of immersion. It's an insight into the to culture. Talk about with folks, yeah. And I think it does give the insight into like what what the character of a people is, is what the what, what the sport love. gives them. Like yeah. American football is all about. It's the American dream, right? It's like you've got to try for something difficult and get it right, and that's wonderful. But like the more difficult it is, the more yardage you'll you'll gain, right? Yeah. But if you if you stuff it up, there's very limited respect. It's not like, oh, you tried and failed. It's like, you tried and you turned it over. This is the end. Australian mm-hmm. football, you just turn it over, the ball turns over six times in a minute. And it's a weird scramble, which is, I think, we're a more laid back, we don't really care about achievement and the, you know, we're much more interested in having a good time and someone doing something impressive. So I heard that Aussie Rules Football, which came from Gaelic football, for those yeah. unaware. And if you haven't heard of Aussie Rules Football, you need to look it up. It's an absolutely magical game. I think, I think the whole the whole world will come to understand it Understand that it's better yeah. than their sports. And anyway, my understanding was they developed it fight and talk. to keep cricket players fit in the winter. Yes. So it's on an oval, yeah, uh, like cricket, unlike Gaelic football, which is on a soccer yeah, field. Yeah. So what was funny is when I moved here, I realized that I just referred to large patches of green as ovals. ovals. None of them are ovals. So I walked home with my then girlfriend, Cameron, and uh, we walked past a school. And I went, there's some bloody bloke on the oval over there. She went, what? The oval? And that's when I realized that. Also, isn't it important to have cricket as like sort of the holy game with a big hinterland, the like respectable, thoughtful game. You have to have that so football can be trivial because sport oh. is meant to be trivial. 
But like no one who loves cricket and football, cricket is the thing that they live for and football is the enjoyable thing that helps the winter pass. But that's the spirit in that's which true. football should be enjoyed. I ah, true, is- but I'm hearing that Aussie rules is far exceeding cricket mm-hmm. as far as well, what they're bringing in every year just financially, right? Oh, for sure, financially. But there's something in the soul of change. cricket. I hope cricket does true. something to the soul. Yeah. There's a great line about cricket that's like the English being a race of people who had no conception of eternity had to invent cricket <laughs> to just get some inkling yeah. of what's. Man, I oh, I'm missing football. Why America has not managed to really export any of their sports? That's a good point. basketball Baseball? a little bit. Baseball to like Japan, Canada, and that's Cuba. A really good. That's the same thing's probably true. I mean, cricket's different, right? I mean, because they colonized the world and brought their sports with them. America's doing a pretty good job of colonizing the world. To every we all know who Taylor Swift is. We all drink Pepsi, but no one, not even Canada, will one for one take the American football that's rules. True. Like we've got to do it a little bit different yeah. to the. American way. It's incredible that no one wants NFL. No one wants gridiron football. Do Maybe they? because it's so expensive to get all the things. NFL is huge in Germany. I guarantee you the NFL is not huge in Germany. <laughs> Germany is not about <laughs> to have an expansion team Thursday. There are some yeah. some people there who are trying. And you do meet people who like these sports internationally. But it's not like I refuse to believe it. Yeah. There's... If Germany gets a professional level NFL team, I'll I will public I will ritually humiliate what, myself on television. What American sport do you think you're most likely to end up enjoying? Oh, football. Yeah. Yeah. Why? I mean, because for me, it would be basketball. I love how quick it is and fancy and colorful it is. I like. Uh, yeah. I find that to be NHL exhausting. seems cool. Too. My dad loves basketball and he's yeah. really good at it. We'll see and it's bar- maybe too many memories now, of me. basketball would be an example of something being exported across the world. It is. I mean... But we still don't have it on mainstream telly, do we? There's something about basketball that's inaccessible to all but very few people in America's physique and the occasional enormous <laughs> Slavic man. <laughs> but, you know, I see Chinese people loving basketball and playing and you go, you're never going to be great. You're five foot six. The three-pointer can only come up. Yeah, all right. They managed to fill one stadium of football. It's... Re- I'm telling you, have you seen the German feelings on soccer? They like it more Thursday. Yeah, so, well, maybe it's the, that England's been able to export the games. Soccer would be another example. But right? those countries don't like, I mean, the, the post-colonial feeling in Pakistan is, I don't think, especially warm to England. Mm-hmm. But they love cricket. They're nutty for cricket. Yeah. Something about cricket is more immediate. Maybe you don't need as much stuff. Maybe soccer is better for the favela, yeah, yeah. where you just have a bunch of rags and no shoes. But yeah. basketball was like that too. It's very cheap to play. It is cheap to play. You just have to be so tall to be good at it. It's something about watching a game that neither I nor anyone related to me would ever be able to compete in professionally it makes it sad. But I watch American football. It's like all body types are accounted for. I could have played football. Not well, not for very long. <laughs> but it's like there's a world in which this body, if it had had a different life, could have played that game. Now, when I was a kid, I remember we would trade NBA basketball cards. How, how's that about colonization? These big In the 90s, it was huge. What about you? Was it Pokemon probably? You... Yu-Gi-Oh was coming yeah. up. I mean, basketball does have like a – it does have a following. People like basketball. But it's not – you could, you could never say that basketball in Australia was – the national sport. No. If we were, if we got into a final at the Olympics, people would be pretty chuffed. Well, there was a time That's I remember it. in the Olympics where they played the dream team, the Aussies, yeah. and I think they did really, really well. I don't think they beat them. I don't they believe that the Americans were sending their best. Yeah. I don't believe Magic sure, Johnson no, was out there. I'm pretty sure Jordan really? and Ewing and Pippen. I'm and we did sure. okay. Barkley. Yeah, I believe so. That's beautiful. We have a couple of players who are here and doing well. Um, what, so what is your game plan now that you're, you've moved to Steubenville? Yeah. Why are you here and what's your plan? I'm going to get a car, first of all. <laughs> Step one. I'm opening for a man, a lovely man called Sam Talent in Columbus. Okay. I'm going to get the car. I'm going to drive to Columbus. I'm going to do five minutes for him. I'm going to drive back to Steubenville. Maybe do that the next day. I might ask my wife if I'm allowed to stay there overnight once or twice. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to try and open for these other Americans, but... I had a. I started a podcast a couple of years ago, and every time I do some something in America, I get a bigger American audience. Yeah. And I think once I have fifty people listening at the moment, there's a lot of people, but they're all spread out. I would just like to go and do comedy in America. Mm. I'm loving. It's so you can just drive two hours, and there's people. There's like four Everywhere, million people yeah. there ready to come and see something. Is there a stand-up comedy bar in Pittsburgh? I'm sure there is. Do they do yeah. open mic? They've got an improv. I'm going to go down there and try and get in there. I'd love to come with you one of these Please, days. please, please. That'd be so fun. Yeah, I want to do the improv. And to get back into that Joe Rogan club, 
I can't so express you, how good it is. You've been invited back. Or? They said, well, invite's a strong word. They okay. said when I was back, I could do spots. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of it is. So what was Egan like? I presume you met him. Oh, Adam Egan was. Egan, sorry. No, he's, uh, he's the man. He was on the, on the show. It's like, because he's not. He's not a comedian. Does he he's, run the he's bar? Run the, he runs the, the gigs. He decides who's on. And he used to run a big gig in Los Angeles. Yeah. And they brought him over there because he was so good at it. But he was really, he was just the guy doing that job at Norm McDonald's friend. Yeah. And uh, it's weird because I think, I think you're not meant to be, you know, he's not a celebrity. You're not meant to be, well, it's yeah. you sit to the left, you sit to the right. Well, he's not a celebrity. So yeah. I, I think... You're not meant to be starstruck by him, but I was more starstruck yeah. by meeting Adam Eggert than yeah. anyone I've met. Because, no, I mean, we've spoken about Norm MacDonald and how incredibly yeah, great it was. Just to be in the orbit of Norm MacDonald yeah. is unbelievable. So is, do you suspect that Joe, uh, Joe Rogan will do his new specials at that place? Or I think so. Does he's, he perform he, there he often? He gigs all the time. Or? Does he? And he's got great people doing gigs there. He's got like a really exciting... Austin has become a hub for comedy, wow. uh, which is nice because you don't have to live in LA. LA seems to be... Not good, is yeah. that? That's something one can say. The homelessness, I mean, the homelessness in oh, Austin was also through the yeah, roof. But it. like having just being that size and having to drive for 45 minutes and mm. the cost of living. What are the top maybe three to five clubs you would be honored to perform at? Oh, that one. That uh, the, one. the mothership again. Because I don't know any the of comedy these, uh, cellar, the stand. And, and where are these? These are in LA? These are in New York. New York, New York still York. has a thriving Does it, yeah. comedy scene. Oh, I'm sure it, yeah. oh it's... I lo- have you been to New York of late? New York City. Let I me say it. a word about New York City. Yeah. When I went to New York City, now things I think have changed since COVID, but it felt like I had finally found a city that could keep up with me. Yeah. And then when I left, yeah. it felt like everything was in po- point two, you know, yeah. it, the speed on the on the podcast went down. And I'm like, why is everything so slow? Yeah. I can see it's very addictive, the energy there. It's um, It's a real city. Right, like it has its own weird character. I'm told. Yeah, people talk this way about uh, what's the one in Louisiana? Um, uh, Baton Rouge got covered by or water. New Orleans, New Orleans. People go New Orleans. There's, right. America has three cities. Uh, you know, New Orleans, New York, and everything else is Cleveland. <laughs> I think it's the old joke, but also I'm thrilled to see Cleveland. Yeah, but. Oh, I'm still excited. I mean, I'm I came in very hot and very excited and like I want to I want to eat Cincinnati chili. I want to go to the Indianapolis Children's Museum just on Wikipedia every day looking at all these incredible yeah. things you could do. And then my dad's come and he's living with us and his enthusiasm has dwarfed my Really? He's like, "Look at the street. Big holes in it. <laughs> Isn't that interesting?" He's um he's very enthusiastic. He's never been to America before. What's your thoughts on the kind of gun culture we have in America and what's your opinion yeah, about mean, it? I don't understand it. <laughs> all right, Thursday, you got you got to quit with the <laughs> Thursday, you can messages. come on my podcast later and we'll talk about yeah. all the things to see in America. The um I don't know. I mean, I I think we spoke about this last time I was on where it's like I I like many of the fruits of America having a gun culture. I like that they didn't try to lock the country down because they thought they couldn't do it. You know, because everyone's packing heat. Uh, and you can just do whatever you want to the citizenry of Australia because they're going to take up their umbrellas against you or something. But, man, also the... It's shocking, isn't it? It's uh, it's like Even bizarre. if you were all down with the Second Amendment, yeah, you know, I love it, big fan, still it's shocking as an Australian to come here and see it being sold in Walmart. I have seen people, I won't say who, <laughs> pack and heat in a Walmart and you go, there's no way that that should be... <laughs> You go pick up a shotgun There's no and a way carton of milk with the safety off. <laughs> There's no way people should be doing that. I like the like the Romans had a system where people could be armed, but you would give your weapons in when you came to the city limit. And that seems very reasonable to me that you would have everyone's allowed to have a gun, but you when you're in a public space, you're not to have a weapon. I think that mm. is a nice happy medium where you can just. But even then, I. Well, I, I don't want to say I won't have a gun because then people will know that I won't have a gun and it's good to break into James's house. <laughs> I don't but have also, the best gun. I mean, imagine. I mean, I was literally lying on my bed yesterday going, I wish God would kill me. Oh, I so don't want a gun in the house. No, this is, I mean, it went away. It's great. Mm. But like, I think anyone predisposed to uh, despair 
maybe yeah. shouldn't have a really quick way of committing suicide on hand. Mm-hmm. I'd like to think I have to walk all the way down to the train tracks. <laughs> let's have a little buffer between. <laughs> let's have. I get to meet Jacob Imam while I'm going for a walk and pulls me <laughs> he out can of. He took me off the ledge. He can give me a little donut and give me a beer. Yeah. Um. Oh man. So I don't understand the gun thing, but I know people are very passionate about it here. I wonder how much to have my own thoughts about. I mean, this is a different country. I don't get to. You get to vote here now, so you get to have a say. But I find the politics to be Insane. totally over my head. Yeah. Do you? When do you th- think? Are, are you? Have you set yourself a time by the end of which you will decide whether you would like to continue living in America or go home, or you just <laughs> take it as it comes? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a three-year visa, so that unless I do something real bad, that they can't. That is terrific. Kick me out to bed. Three years. It's a three-year visa. Um, I mean, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to provide for the family and I've got to be doing stand up, and that might involve living in a city that has stand up. I want to do something for Steubenville while we're here. My wife was, she said yesterday, I don't know how long we're going to be in Steubenville for. What can we do to help? Because it's, a, who we it's need a beautiful place town. and we've been invited in. Yeah, she's a good woman. She's I a like really good a woman and she really, uh, she really means it. So it's like, I don't know what we can offer and bring. I mean, I'd like to just go out and get. Because they've had a big run on the secondhand bookstore, and I love buying books. I would like to take a thousand dollars and go into Pittsburgh and go into like estate sales and just buy books and mm. bring them back and be like, you know, because so many people read here, and there is one bookstore in the downtown. Yeah, here's I can give you this big catalog of things to take. I had to get rid of so many books in Adelaide. It was uh, that was brutal. That was my hardest thing to move too. I shipped books. about three boxes over. But it was hard. I had all these plans of like, I'm going to sort the books and have the ones I want and the ones yeah. I'm not going to. And then it's like two days before we have to leave and I'm looking at a copy of German lyric poetry going, <laughs> I don't speak ge- like how. But I need it. <laughs> I don't want to get rid of it. This was like a book with good energy. Is there an additional cigarette that I could perhaps. Uh, oh, you, how many of you. Yeah. How many did you go through? I love it. I'll put in a. Do you want the rest of my uh, cigar? Hold on. I'm going to put in a Zin. All right. Have you seen the Zin? Oh, yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> Apparently, they don't cause cancer. I can't believe that's true. Whoa. Thanks, Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it would be nice to do something for. What have we got here? Cool mint. Good Thank to you. do something for Steubenville. That's good. That's oh, the, I love it. I mean, that's, that's also, who we need here. It's so weird. Every day I'm walking around, I mean, I don't know what I could actually do that would be useful. I mean, what's strange for you is you haven't, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you haven't experienced other towns or cities in America, have you? At this kind of. I've been to Inglewood, Queens. Okay. And Steubenville. Yeah. And Austin. That's yeah. it. Those are my big four. I would like to see normal, suburban, tedious America. Yeah. I was just there. Where were you? Dallas. Uh, you know, Dallas? I mean, even then. And then McKinney. It's a city where of- a president was shot through the head. I mean, that's at least, not everywhere can say that. That's at <laughs> least right, a little exciting. I think of another one, but, yeah. but I would like to, I mean, we also wanted to, I want to steal whatever it is people have here. Whatever the the motivating Holy Spirit, civic virtue that people got and they're living their lives with, I want to get in that and take it and have it yeah. and share it with the, I mean, just me and my family. It, it feels like spiritually it's a very good place to be. Yeah. Well, even the other night, you and your bride popping over and me texting so nice. someone to walk a couple of doors down, have a pipe with us, play yeah. a game of chess. This is this is how we live in Steubenville. It's just... Text, text whoever they come over. We're all just. I mean, I'm getting to know the people at the at the dive bar downtown. Oh, I bet they're having love you. weird conversations with their great big whiskies that they pour you. Yeah, they really do. I remember going to Australia. I'll have a double. I'm like, there's no way that's a double. Yeah, give come me here to a America. quadruple, please. Yeah. I'll, I'll pay what it's worth. The yeah. cost of living here is also. It it feels like it might make that possible. Yeah. Not overall in America, but in Steubenville, where you can buy a house for whatever forty thousand dollars. I mean, Australia, it's like yeah, you, you'll be paying. Seven hundred thousand dollars for a bad house, mm-hmm. very far away with no room to raise a family, and I know it's not just about having material provisions for your children, but man, it does help to own a house. I think renting is bad for the soul long term. I also think I wonder if um, homeschooling is a lot easier than I think people often think. There's so many rules about homeschooling in well, Australia. People, I think people is that right? Yeah, like just getting together with another homeschool family suddenly starts to look like an unregulated school for which you can be punished by the state. Just the the freedom in America. Like, people probably should wear bike helmets, but to not have to yeah. is, I'm like a kid in a candy shop. Right. Every Just that whole sense of, like, do whatever you want 
we want you to go and succeed. Yeah. I don't get that in Australia at all, you know? But the, the point I was going to say is like, you, you know, you, you and your wife, I don't know if you've considered homeschooling. I'm not trying to talk you into it. It's just to no, say think, it's a lot easier than I think people sometimes think. Yeah. And that makes it a lot cheaper as a family living in Steubenville if you're not paying to yeah. go to a school. I think if there was a school that we... There's a couple of good Montessori schools here. Like. and I'm like 90% down with the Montessori thing. And mm. then they'll say something where it's like, we don't think reading's that important. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? It's so important to be able to read. And I think it's really frightening for parents whose parents didn't homeschool them. Because yeah. you're so, especially when they disapprove of you homeschooling. I'm not, my parents did that. They dis no, disapproved of that. And, but, and so we were nervous because we were like, yeah, we get it. We, lo- we get that we could screw this up, but this is what we've decided to do. Fighting back against the disapproval of people along this journey has been. Especially when you're not sure it's going to pan out. I mean, That's, it gets easier sometimes when. I think people's perception of what is happening in a public school is coming into line with what's happening in public schools. Yeah. So people who five, ten years ago might have said, why would you homeschool your children? Are you insane? That's for ridiculous. Yeah. Now would go, well, no, you know, you don't want them castrating your son. And they do have so a maybe kitty not a terrible box at the idea. back of this place because ah. someone identifies as a cat. Not a joke. M- no, it. no. Yeah. My favorite is when the, the private schools that are single sex have a trans person. And they, oh. try, they try to be inclusive and go like, well, Timmy's Jemima now and uh, we're going to let her live her best life. You go, if you were actually being inclusive to that trans person, you'd kick them out of the school and respect that they're really a girl. And you'd say you have absolutely no place in our all boys high school, is right? Is this a bit you're working on? Because it would No, be, this is just that. Xavier would, College came out in Australia excellent. and they were like, we, don't, we, we will accept, exclude, we're not going to accept girls, but we will accept trans girls, which is... Which is the biggest middle finger yeah. to the trans people, I would think. Maybe that could be a bit. Someone remind me that I said that. <laughs> <laughs> do you have, uh, like, just do you do it on, on, your, on your phone notes? Do you start putting yeah, down yeah, little I bits think, and pieces? Man, what's that? I'm trying, to get, I'm trying to get some new bits about America. Help me. Help me with a bit about America. Hold oh, on. I've got to think that through. What else have I gone? What else have I noticed about this country? The harp and habit. I wrote that down. I want to go there. Meant to have a birthday party for Thursday. We'll just watch the football later. Whether or not someone called Zion Williamson is fat, that's a big question that I hear a lot of Americans talk about. He's a basketball player who is apparently fat. Those are my only nights on America thus far. (laughs) Again, I'm generating material slowly. I'm trying to do the accent uh, so that I can, you know, do commercials and things. So I watched the news for a full day just to repeat what they were saying to try and get the accent. And all I got was... Jeffrey Epstein has been having sex parties with young girls. That's actually a really That's good my accent. accent. That's the only one I can. And I can, I can do this accent. There's not as much demand for this accent in <laughs> commercials in America, but I think I'll do this one pretty good. <laughs> it sounded like uh, Harrelson, who was here with the pipe smoking fella. Is he speaking this way? Yeah, yeah, he does, does he own a large house that produces a lot of cotton in the South? Close. Close, yeah. Close, I think. <laughs> it's, um... I have no. I, I really have no idea what I'm doing. Do you know if you live in Steubenville, yeah, your kids will get half off the tuition. No, half off tuition. Oh, half off tuition at, at this school just by living here. I mean, that's good. I like that. If they want to go there, but I think they should go to St. Joseph. Your to children are American. I found that they're half and half. They're Australian. They speak. Oh, they speak I see what with you mean. The accent. Yeah, yeah. The, I've heard that if you leave after you're 12, you'll keep the accent. So if your kids stay here, they'll all sound like little Yanks as well. <laughs> I mean, there are worse things that could happen to them. Mm-hmm. I love it. It's American not an offensive accents. way of speaking. When people say, I love your accent, what do you say when they say that to you? I've got like, oh, thanks, mate. <laughs> it's beautiful to be in your country. Do you ever ham it up to get what you want? Oh, man. I just, I, well, I realize when I'm trying to, I now do an Australian accent when I'm speaking to people here that's like more, when I'm imp- doing an impersonation of Australian to yeah. maybe distance myself from it's funny I do the Aussie. Too, yeah. What's hard is I can't do a New Zealand accent here because they can't distinguish between my accent and uh-huh. a Kiwi accent. So any <laughs> so joke that I have, it's funny. I've got to do this voice. They go, You've, he's just kept speaking in a strange way. Man, New Zealand. Even so, my we went to in Dunedin. We went. My wife went to the Latin Mass there when we were just becoming Catholic and she, there were like three people there and we went back there and there were like 20 people there. It's happening. This boom in the, in the 
So I, I gave my hypothesis, order. which wasn't terribly original, but just the idea that we want to be enchanted. We, we, yeah. want, we want reverence. We're tired of the sloppy way of living. We want our heritage back in a world that's fluid culturally. Yeah. Do you have an assessment as to why people are rushing back to tradition? I don't really know why I like it. I mean, there's certainly there's a lot of people on the fringe right who've come in. You, you meet quite a lot of people who were very right wing and it may have had like Nazi or fascist sympathies and they've, there's something about the world that they thought was wrong and they've yeah. misdiagnosed that that might be an answer and then they've found that there is a the better. But people go, you know, I want to I want to live in some sort of community. I don't want to be alone. Yeah. Um, and then picking not a very good community in my opinion and then finding that this is a much better, vibrant, family-oriented thing. When I started going to – when I had my first uh, – with, with my priest, Father Mac – Mac Daddy, he doesn't like being called especially. Um, but when we were doing catechism, he's like, why are you coming along? And one of the first things I said was, there are so many big happy families here. And yeah. he said, you want to take what they have and have it for yourself. And I was like, yeah. And he went, oh, good. That's reason I have to keep going with the catechism. <laughs> I think what is then hard for people who are coming in, because a lot of people come in ironically, uh, and there's, what, there's what a big wave. <laughs> you know, like... People who enjoy coming to mass but are not really having a they know they know that something is beautiful uh, is taking place and there's classical music and there's incense and it's a very beautiful thing um but they they are not signed up to all of the the dogmas or whatever mm -hmm. or maybe they think transubstantiation is a bit unusual which you know, it's, it is unusual it is, yeah. um so it's how you then I don't know how anyone makes that jump from this is an ironic, I can see that this is good for me and I'm following along ironically other than uh, personal encounter or, I mean, having children knocks the irony right out of you quick smart because you don't, there's, there's no time for that Survive. sort of nonsense. Yeah. But I think, yeah, it'll be interesting how people continue to grow in the, like a lot of, a lot of the trad thing is people LARPing. Yeah. And people use that term and they're, but you know. see, I'm sympathetic to people who are LARPing in that regard because I feel like we've been born into a cultureless yeah. swamp. It's and, a good place to and, start. And we're not wrong to want what we were never given. Yes. And so I tend to be much more sympathetic than I used to be yeah. to folks with pocket watches and things like that at mass. I think good <laughs> for you. The tweed jackets, man. Yeah, bring it on. And I enjoy the tweed jacket. There is like a... Fake it till you make it. There is definitely a trad dad uniform. What does it look a like? crumpled chino <laughs> and a blue checked shirt <laughs> and a tweed jacket and a fatigue. Basically someone who looks like me on a Sunday. Mm. But um and the women in their in their long dresses and their They're beautiful. It's yeah. so beautiful. No, I mean I love it. I love it, but it's the aesthetic of it can't sustain you through the hard no. dark times. And if it can help you get in to find the bits that I will sustain you, you to reach out and hold God. Yeah. But yeah, I, no, think, I see what you mean. I once, had a, I once had a bishop say, and it's along these lines, he said, you ask any priest after five months of being ordained, is wearing the shiny vestments enough? Yeah. Is being called father enough? Likewise with the married couple five months in, like is having sex, is, is that enough? And, and both would be like, it helps, but no, like it's got to go deeper than that. <laughs> I'm not going to make a joke about the... Sex going deeper. I'm oh going to just move gosh. right on past yeah, it. Yeah, right. I'm trying to be a good <laughs> boy. Guest. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, I... that can only really happen within, oh man, being at that holy hour. And I started reading, I had tried to read it earlier on in becoming a Catholic. A friend had given me, and I lost, and Jack, I'm sorry, but I lost his copy of Jesus of Nazareth by oh, Benedict. Yeah. And it didn't really, I just, I just thought it was sort of boring. Oh. And I started reading it again last night at the holy hour. I got through the first two chapters. It's the most exciting book. It is, yes. I'm glad yeah. you've come to that no, conclusion. I, I like, <laughs> That's what I often think. If I read <coughs> Thomas or Benedict and I think it's boring, I'm definitely wrong. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, there's something in there that I'm not getting. But it's mm. it's nice to be in it and growing in non... Because keeping your, keeping your catechesis going once you have children is really hard. Like, you, I read my way into the faith in a lot of ways. It's like, all right, we're going to have a family and then when you have young children to have the time to get away to keep learning about yeah. the faith is really hard so the fact that unlike you know fairly literal protestant things that are going on there are so many ways to point towards and deepen your understanding just mm. to get to to look at iconography in the house mm. to just look at a saint for a couple of seconds a day and how that when you then come back to reading about it that mm. has enriched your ability to do it is nice non 
nonverbal ways of understanding. Yeah. Is uh which is also like that's why I don't think parents have to be terribly concerned about catechizing their children. Yeah. In because you just you just the culture well, of the you, home in a, is catechetical, but not up. in a preachy way, you know. Yeah. So we do our little prayers, we go to this Saint Day party. I mean, I don't know if you know this yet, but people in Steubenville, everyone chooses a Saint Day. Nice. I, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of people choose a Saint Day and they have a big party at their house for that day. And it's so beautiful and it's not yeah. like it's overly religious. We just get together and we have food and drink and yeah. chat and that's it. Uh, like, you, who's you need, your saint? Uh, you know what? I haven't picked one, but I, I'm picking one now. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, because that's my birthday. Yeah, 16th nice. of July. From now on. That's, oh, that, that, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good way to get out of having it to be your birthday <laughs> party as well. It's always right. an uncomfortable oh, time. You guys didn't bring a gift? No, I find out. My, my daughter was born on... Who's your confirmation saint? St. John of the, the Evangelist. Yeah. That was definitely a... I'm getting more out of the other Gospels now, but when I started, the fact that it was so weird... And poetic and yeah. deep and, and beautiful. Yeah, and that I don't understand what's going on mm. at all, but it is, yeah, he's, he's writing very strange poetry. Is, uh, did if there was room for that, I loved, and that really helped. Did, did, did your dad convert? He converted the same time as I did. He wow. started going to the Ordinariate in Adelaide, and he comes to mess with us. That's beautiful. And, uh, yeah, it's good. It's was really, that awkward it's really to have him convert? Well, I mean, not awkward, I suppose. But <laughs> no, no, I was thrilled. Were the two of you sharing think, what you were learning? As I you think were... I managed to have my confirmation. You know, like I was at the midnight mass and he was at the morning. So I did still manage to get in there a couple of hours before <laughs> him. But um, yeah, it's good. We should we should talk about it more. What? Oh, just the faith. It's, you know, we, we haven't had a relationship talking about God. We talk about politics a lot. Yeah. But to talk about the faith would be... To yeah, to build into your. I find it really hard when I'm like on the road and I'm I'm with somebody and like praying before a meal, which you don't have. You don't have to say grace before every meal if you're having a snack. If you and want you don't, heartburn, you yeah. don't do it. Yeah, and you do a big. Yeah. But it's um to like to instantiate that and have that structure is yeah. lovely. So the more things I can build into my life that have that. I mean, you just, when we were leaving your house the other night, you just like lit a candle. Like it was a very normal thing. That, yeah. And now the Hail Marys are taking place. Yeah. Well, and I also think it's important to take into account your children's, you know, uh, bandwidth. You know, so if I, Boy. and my wife said to me before we, before we, you guys left, she's like, honey, let's keep it quick because they, they got to go. <laughs> she's free. And she, that was good of her. Lady. But it's also good just to, okay, what can my kids actually do? Three yeah. Hail Marys, that's what we're going to do right now before bed. I mean, my daughter does uh, a prayer before she goes to sleep each night. We do like, prayers together and she has her bit that is her and no one else must say her prayer yeah. and she'll often like rush through it or get a word wrong and it's like i'm not gonna it's just it's great that she's doing it and she's loving it and she you know saying the evening prayer is a big part of her life but then certainly you know try to do the lord's prayer and there's a two-year-old who's just repeatedly <laughs> punching me and telling me he hates me <laughs> it's a hard it's a hard thing to get in it is hard because you have to change your understanding of how prayer ought to look we have a kind of romanticized, kind of like with marriage, right? You have a romanticized way of how your date night will go every single week. Yeah. And you have to be okay with it not going like that because you're sick or you're bored or you're angry or irritated. I think prayers like that too, if you have this romanticized view of prayer, you're likely to give up because you'll think that you're failing every time it doesn't go the way you thought well, it should. If it's, if it's built into so many things that it's it's got to happen mm -hmm. no matter what yeah. the circumstances are. But I, I remember as a good. young dad getting frustrated with my kids because they wouldn't sit still. Yeah. And prayer has gotten so much better since I've stopped caring. You know, and I'm like, look, the kids, it's fine. He's building a fort while we're while we're praying. Is that your Apple Watch? It says e exercise ring load. Yeah, we better take a break Thursday. I gotta do a quick exercise and then we'll come back with some questions from our local supporters. I got to tell you guys about my new favorite app. It's called Ascension and it's by Ascension Press. This is the number one Bible study app, in my opinion. And uh, you can go to ascensionpress.com slash frad. Go there. Uh, and so that way they know that we sent you. It is absolutely fantastic. It has the entire Bible there, very well laid out. The, the whole Bible is read to you by Father Mike Schmidt, so just sections of the Bible. It has the catechism there. It's cross-referenced absolutely beautifully. It's really actually quite difficult to explain to you how good this is. Just download it and check it out for yourself. It even has over 1,600 frequently asked questions about Scripture. So if you go to Genesis 1, you might have a question about evolution. Well, there's a drop-down right there. You can read an article that'll help you understand it. Um, 
I went through it with the guys at Ascension the other day, and my mouth, my jaw was just, it had, it was dropped. It, it was absolutely amazing. Um, it's had tens of thousands of five-star reviews. Again, go to ascensionpress.com slash frad. It also has all of their amazing Bible studies. So I remember back in the day, I had a big DVD case of Jeff Caven's Bible studies. Well, it's all there on the app. So go download it right now. Please go to ascensionpress.com slash frad. I want to tell you about a course that I have created for men to overcome pornography. It is called strive21.com slash Matt. You go there right now, or if you text strive to 66866, we'll send you the link. It's 100% free, and it's a course I've created to help men, to give them the tools to overcome pornography. Usually men know that porn is wrong. They don't need me or you to convince them that it's wrong. What they need is a battle plan to get out. And so I've distilled all that I've learned over the last 15 or so years as I've been talking and writing on this topic into this one course. Think of it as if you and I could have a coffee over the next 21 days and I would kind of guide you along this journey. That's basically what this is. It's incredibly well produced. Uh, we had a whole camera crew come and film this. Um, and I think it'll be a really a real help to you. And it's also not an isolated course that you go through on your own because literally tens of thousands of men have now gone through this course. And as you go through the different videos, there's comments from men all around the world encouraging each other, offering to be each other's accountability partners and things like that. Strive21, that's strive21.com slash Matt, or as I say, text, text strive to 66866 to get started today. You won't regret it. My new poem might be okay. Uh -huh. Right? Um, if the Illuminati exists, why haven't they given me a call? This one's all right. I hope now if there's any additional cigarettes. There's none. Damn! Oh, pipe? Let's yeah. smoke a pipe. There you go. Oh! Thank you. I'm going to do it wrong and everyone will. Well, no, am I on the air? I think my poetry is the future, and I'm misunderstood in my own time. Not all of the poems. We're trying to get better. So I pack it in. Oh. That did not feel like two hours. You're on the air. Hello, everybody. I'm here to say I'm going to do the podcast in a James Donald Forbes McCann type way. <laughs> Later on today, Thursday's birthday, I'm going to take him to a bar. I'm going to go watch the Steelers, my beloved Steelers, who are having a difficult year. So we taught you enough about pipe smoking the other day to make it I'm work. going to be okay. All right, my beautiful, beautiful local supporters, they're all very attractive, sevens or higher, have asked questions, and I'm going to take oh. a look at some of them now. Not all. All right. Some. Um, why is Bruce Willis on the cover of James' poem book? Marlon Brando. Marlon okay. Brando's on the cover. 
Marlon Brando 911. Thank you for looking up the book of poems. I got a man. What does kangaroo meat taste like? Takes forever to cook. Tastes like deer, doesn't it? Yeah, deer. Yeah, it's just like gamey. Yeah. yeah, it is. Can I have that? Oh yeah. You ever had kangaroo balls? I've never had the balls. I noticed that you've had you've got the scrotum. I've got the scrotum taxiderm right there. Apparently emu meat was heralded as that was going to be the big replacement for cow in the nineties. They tried to export emus to America to try and get that off the ground. America was like, thanks, but nah. <laughs> no, we're, we're, we're pretty this good. is not uh, the direction we've decided to go. <laughs> <laughs> I took when I when my wife visited Australia for the first time. I took her out for kangaroo. I don't think I told her what it was until she was halfway through Good it. Lord, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, CTC, who's got a great YouTube channel called Judo Comical, I believe it is. Nice, CT. If I'm to be honest, I think it's too complicated a name, and you should change it. People don't know how to type that in. Have as many names as you can. My podcast is the James Donald Forbes for Can Catamaran Plan. And, and as many people ask me to change it, I refuse. <laughs> Do you have advice for singles, he says, who seek community? It seems that places like Steubenville are more family focused. That's not necessarily no. true. Look at the yeah, Thursday single. He's having a great time. It's a lot of great single folks. <laughs> Mike Mike says, coming from a country with very strict immigration rules and coming into the U.S. legally with a visa, how do you feel about or where do you side with the border crisis in the U.S.? Do you feel it contradicts our Christian faith position? You didn't expect such a serious question, did you? No, I'm happy to get into it. I'd like to talk about my country first. Yeah. Um, I mean, they've they've just... Our our sweet nation of Australia has imported 600,000 people last year, which is bigger than Tasmania. That they've just imported, and there's a there's a genuine. We don't have enough homes for people. Yeah, and so like families are living in their car. I'm not opposed to having more people come into the country, but you you need some sort of way of housing. Yeah, them. it's just, it's simple than just saying something like everyone's welcome. That's easy to say, and then it's like, well, what, what are you going to do about the single mum living in her in a tent in Murray yeah. Bridge with her kids? Mm-hmm. Um, which is not to say that other people aren't also struggling, but you have a duty as a country to look after people. And then it takes time to build those houses. And also the amount of restrictions on building a house at Silly. I'd like to just be in a caravan in the woods with my family. Here's what the Catechism of the Catholic Church says. Political authorities, for the sake of the common good for which they are responsible, may make the exercise of the right to immigrate subject to various juridical conditions, especially with regard to the immigrants' duties toward their country of adoption. Immigrants are obliged to respect with gratitude the material and spiritual heritage of the country that receives them, to obey its laws and to assist in carrying civic burdens. I'm doing my best to do those things as a proud visitor to this country. Johnny 6767G says, who is your favorite comedian and who would you call a comedian's comedian? Every comedian I talk to thinks Norm MacDonald is the best comedian. Why do they I mean, I agree, but, but there's, some, there's something why? about Norm that... He's so natural. He's so he's just you fucked. sense a great oh, the honesty. He's not trying to yeah. sell you anything. He's um, he loves to he loves the committing to the joke, even when that's going to get him in trouble. The best comedian working today. Also, in terms of another dead comedian, Bernie Mac. Last time I was in town, I was forced by Shane Gillis to sit down and watch several hours of Bernie Mac, and I had a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, but living like Steve Harvey. Not enough is said about how good a comedian Steve Harvey is. He is outstanding. I, I recommend that everyone go and watch Ghetto Wedding, which is a 20-minute bit he does about going to a wedding in the ghetto. Uh, it's so funny. I mean, in terms of Australians, the recently passed Barry Humphreys was yeah. unbelievable and seemingly made no impact in America outside of being in a couple episodes of Ally McBeal. But uh, look up some Dame Edna highlights. That's a, that's a drag queen you can get behind, mm-hmm. you know? How many kids do you have? Only three, but they're four, four, two, and one. Yeah. Who is your primary audience, says this question. I can't read his name. It's too complicated. But who's your primary audience you're wanting to reach and for what reason? There's a man named Sam McDonough who I went to university with. And when I think about what I expect an audience to know and what I'd like them to know and where I'd like to meet them at, I sometimes think I'm talking to my friend. Hmm. He's a great man. There's a couple other people that I, I think about because it's too hard when there's a hundred people there and you're trying to 
you can't just talk to yourself. That would be insane. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, in the same way that that would be like, if you were actually just trying to talk to God and to think that I an mean, audience is not going to understand all the references that you privately have in your own thoughts and communication. But I, you do have, you have to guess like where, where are people at? What is there? How many big words can I use in a short period of time when I've had a couple of drinks at night? And I, I think of Sam, he's what I'd like my audience to be. Matt asks, are you hoping to go to a Trump rally? Yes, no, and why? Yes. I'd love to go to a Trump rally. I would like to go to a Biden rally if they let members of the public in. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It just always seems very controlled and there's 50 Democrat donors there. But the thought of going to like a visceral mm-hmm. American political happening would be would be nice, wouldn't it? I think so. I'd like to go. Yeah. Okay. Will you come with me to a Trump rally? If I'm here, I probably won't right. be. I'll be in Austria for the next five months, but Thursday we'd uh, you'll love be, to come. I think he may pick up the nomination and you may be lucky enough to have more opportunities. Yeah. You think so? Do you have any flesh uh, well, thoughts on Well, they may kill him, mm. uh, but they may not kill him. I mean, I don't know. It's a, this country is so much further away from civil war than it looks in the media from outside the country. From outside, just watching yeah. your news, it looks like everyone's ready to divide into fiefdom, you know, war chiefs. But I think... I think a lot of it is rhetoric and having, did you, did you knock on wood in hopes that that would take place? <laughs> Who is the funniest female comedian that you, you're, yeah. I'm loving Michelle Wolf at the moment. Mm-hmm. She's doing great work. Um, I think Michelle, I would watch an hour of Michelle Wolf anytime. I don't know her. She does have a bit celebrating abortion, mm. but I think she's become a Muslim since then and oh. may have dispensed with it. She's on a journey. I got into an argument with a fella flying to the Middle East about abortion. PhD guy, yeah. you know, we were sitting next to each other and his arguments were absolutely hopeless. And I was surprised that me, who was just doing my undergrad at the time, was mm. destroying him. And he, he, you could tell he was destroyed. Like he, he, he knew he was. So as we were standing up, getting our bags from the top, he, he brought in a woman, uh, a, what did they call hostess? Yeah. What to, yeah, like, look at this guy. He's, he's get for the abortion. stewardess to say. But here's what was cool. Yeah. She was Muslim. Nice. And so she started, she joined my side. We love our separated brethren. Yeah, me, me and a Muslim lady just just going at it on this, this clown. Guy. And as we left, he actually said these words. Well, I, I cannot believe he said this, except it's true. Well, I think your arguments are definitely better than mine, but I'm going to keep, I'm going to just gonna keep, keep holding to abortion. I, th- I mean, I have some respect for the pro-abortion people who concede that it's killing, and they just have a worldview where it's okay to kill people to make your life more convenient. That's a consistent position. Yeah. I don't think it's a good yeah, position, right. and I don't see how you can live you, with yourself thinking that. But at least, increasingly, I think people are copying to the fact that it's not just you know, a procedure that should be safe, legal, and privately with her doctor and doesn't impinge on the rights of anybody else. Kyle, That's progress. Kyle Whittington says, what's your elevator pitch for the monarchy? It's so cool, Kyle. The crowns. The parades, the music, having the head of state separated from the political argy bargy. Oh, yes. I mean, I don't even like this king. I don't even like the current king, but to have a king, to have, you know, I mean, I think people cry out for a king in the Old Testament and God gives them one and he says it would be better if, if they didn't have one, if just, if God was the king and we could regulate ourselves properly. But, uh, if you don't think you're living through the book of Judges right now, I you know read the news. Patrick says, and uh, James, do you follow Aussie footy, an Aussie footy team, or are you like Matt and just watch cricket? First of all, I don't just watch cricket. I love Aussie rules football. And do you Pride ever- of South Australia, the mighty Adelaide Crows. I would like, as my ambition, to make them America's team. If I can, if I can get it to be half as successful as NFL football is in Germany... <laughs> I'd be very happy, but I'd like it to be the Crowies. We've gonna... had oh, a long, dark, difficult years. The coach was murdered by his son. Yep. We went on to lose a grand final. They took the players on a camp where they maybe tortured them a little bit in some ways. Certainly some people were unhappy after the camp. And now it's all coming together. Big Tex Walker is back from his racism scandal and playing incredible football. Isaac Rankin is an absolute delight. If, that, if that hamstring stays right and tight, we're going to be okay. Rory Sloan's going around another time. I, the passion I have for the Crows is it means something to love the Crows. It's like whatever the 90s was, I feel that spirit really lives in the Crows. See, I still remember when it was the VFL. Mm. Uh, do I? Or I remember when it was the AFL without an Aussie t- uh, Adelaide team. Yeah. Uh, you know, South Australia Wouldn't team. it be nice if so they I was just a- kept South Australia's own competition as the, as yeah. the best one? 
I, I was I was a Ruse supporter. The Ru- my uncle is a Ruse supporter. They managed to get out. They were so unsuccessful at home that they did, I think, a good job exporting. Remember Wayne Carey. You can't escape from Wayne Carey. Is that right? He is a. Uh, is he big in a? He's a tr- he's a troubled man. Because I haven't you know been in Australia forever, so I don't know what's going uh, on. Check the Wikipedia page. He's gone through some hard times. Yeah. He, um, What's Tony Modra doing with himself these days? A lot of corporate events. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's good. Uh, Jay Ladder says, any plans for a short US tour while here? Yes. Missed him while he was at the Comedy Mothership. They saw me at the Comedy... Oh, I didn't see me. Oh, well. They said they missed you. I'm, I'm going to go back to the Comedy Mothership, but uh, <coughs> as soon as I have 50 listeners in one place, I will go there. I don't what, know how many you... I mean, you should probably have, do you think, given that you want to kind of grow an audience here, do you have a particular social media that you're trying to let people know what you're uh, doing and when? Yes. I mean, I have an Instagram, yeah. but I would love to get off of Instagram because of the in, algorithm immorality. and what it tries to... Mm. Uh, I actually, I told it... I told it to stop showing me beautiful, uh, big-breasted women. Mm-hmm. And then after the fifth one where I said, I don't want to see this anymore, it started showing me Muslim videos about the importance of becoming a Muslim. Oh. So I think it's You're getting, yeah. Yeah, it's getting closer. Ryan says, are well-read comedians like the clown in the theater, are they better than comedians who don't know things? Victor, Emma, who's this? Um, er, Eremita would like to know. Uh, I'm I'm often shocked by how smart comedians are, and people are much better read than me. And I just sort of freak of circumstance talk like Frasier or something. I, I, Frasier's a great show. I love Frasier. I've started it's, watching it's the so new clever. one. They brought it back. Is it's, the new one any good? It's okay. You know, I mean, the old one went bad at some point. I'm so bad at pipe smoking. Well, I can't the, keep it going. Difficulty with pipes is, you know, unless you keep it in your craw, it's likely to go out. AMM says, James, excellent job with the quality and training videos you did. I love the way you were respectful, truthful, loving, and funny. Did you get any response? Was that encouraging or discouraging? Response was great. I found it, uh, yeah, I mean, there were a lot that were not respectful that ooh, we didn't sense because it was, it was a challenge. Um, I had that job. Is the re- I know some people who have worked in call centers and things didn't like that. So I always tried to call people whose call center jobs were pointless yeah. rather than someone who's working on a KPI, like someone who's working a, you know, as, as PR for a chocolate factory or like the McDonald's hotline. Yeah. That woman's getting three calls a day and none of them are important yeah. and she's bored and she's quite happy to have someone to talk to. That's That was the general response I got. I think a lot of people saw that you were doing these phone calls and thought, why is he picking on these fat people? And then they go there and they realize, oh, he's actually making them laugh and they're having a good time and he's not mocking them and he's, you know. I try not to mock people. Sometimes when, when you're on the stage and someone is heckling, okay, that's you, a good I question. get into too much fun putting them down. Uh, yeah, when I ask that, yeah. what, do you have a standard way or a few ways to respond to a heckler? And do you lay no. in bed at night thinking about how to do that? Uh, no, I mean, you just wish the quality of the heckling was better because usually when <laughs> someone's ready to heckle, they've got a couple of drinks in and they don't have anything interesting to say at all. Can you remember one kind of response that you gave? Oi, Harry Potter! This is one I get sometimes. You, There's a circular glasses, man. Oh, yeah. You might have got Harry Potter! Oh, I see. But um, response, I mean, when you can, when I, I love not having to do my material because I find it so hard to write and so boring to say things I've said before. So when someone really wants to talk and like have a respectful, weird back and forth on stage, it's so nice. I know, maybe you shouldn't say that publicly because you don't want people thinking they have to do that when they come along, but it is wonderful. Uh, well, you know, you just said that kind of repeating things that you've said before you find boring. And I, I, a case in point of that is I remember when you, you gave this excellent bit about for me once, yeah. for me twice, for me three times, and you went on. And it was so funny. And then you came and did a stand-up bit at our cigar lounge, and I, I asked you at the end, hey, do that bit. And you said, I, I've, I don't know what I forgot. Well, I did it. I did it three times. I recorded it the first time I did it. It went well. And I think the premise is too similar to a David Cross oh. joke. I mean, he goes in a different direction, but he, he also, he starts by going, fool me once, fool me twice, fool me three times, and then ah. he keeps going. Then he goes in a different direction. So I felt ashamed that I had had parallel thinking with another person. Oh, so, and, and did I you realize it. that after your joke or did you I, pay? I thought beforehand someone must have done this. I asked people, okay. I put it on Reddit. Someone said, this is a Dimitri Martin joke. I look, I could not find anything that Dimitri Martin had done similar. Yeah. So I did it and I recorded it and I put it out. And then eventually someone said, you are a thief. Oh, that's this is tough. David Cross. And it's like, well, I could take it down. It was genuine parallel thinking. Taking it down probably makes me look more guilty. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a nice joke. Now, I don't think it is there. Bringing together two things we've talked about. One, you you not liking to be scripted, right? Yeah. Because you find it boring. But then you also said it kind of doesn't respect the audience. And yet, if mm. you were invited to give a five or 13 minute bit and it was a really important yeah. comedy club, presumably you're going to be a lot more scripted than you otherwise would. I mean, you wouldn't want it to seem yeah. scripted, right? There is but, a, within that short amount of time, there's a, of really like crashing the five and doing like everything is so tight. And, so tight. Yeah. It's like you're playing a pop song. That rhythm is really exciting to be in with people. But in terms of, yeah, I, I only have, ah, I would like more material that I could enjoy doing that way all the time. But it is, you know, you, it's got to be alive for you, right? Like it's got to mean yeah. something while you're saying it or it's, yeah. it's really dull. Like I'll see some people who are just reciting their work and they, Hannah Gadsby has a bit, and I do actually, Hannah Gatsby was a good comedian when she was doing the clubs. I she is. In, uh, she did Nanette. Uh, and she was a really strong club comedian. But then she had a bit later on where she was like, I'm not really doing my comedy, I'm reciting it. Huh. I'm just thinking of the words that I've thought of before. And it's, I would love to be able to to do that. I would love to like just have the, the my little words that I get up and say one after the other yeah. and try and make it sound right. But I'm not, I'm a bad actor. Yeah. I'm a seriously bad actor. People, are sh people try and cast me in things and then are shocked by how bad I am at acting. It would be so nice that if the skills would double up, yeah. but I cannot do it. Yeah. Wouldn't it? Oh, it'd be, it'd open up so I'd get commercials. What a big, beautiful car that is. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, what are your thoughts on Jerry Seinfeld? I love Jerry Seinfeld. I just watched, I started watching Curb Your Enthusiasm on the flight over. I'd never watched it before. Do you respect wood? Anyway, that was a bit in the episode. Yeah, that's, that, there's a show that's incredibly funny but gets incredibly vulgar, so I just refuse to watch it. But there are bits how, in well, that. How do you feel about So in cinema, like there was – so Oppenheimer came out and there was a sex scene in Oppenheimer. So I refuse to watch it. Yeah. yeah. I watched it and loved it, yeah. but I, I understand that. Yeah. I mean, I'm also Is not, he moving away again? Yeah. Okay. I am a mover. Stay I'm there. a mover. Maybe keep – don't touch the mic and that'll, right, that'll be right. your litmus test on my, as to where on to go. Mark. Um yeah, I mean, there's no other nudity, I don't think, in other Christopher Nolan films. And I think the sex scene, he's not trying to make it a, a sexy, erotic thing. He's trying to make, like, a weird, dark point. Yeah. Um, I mean, some of it's my own past of once, mm. once having been hooked on this stuff and yeah, never wanting to being go terrified. back to it. It's, you know, it's also kind of like, you know, if you played sport as a kid and you damaged your body in some particular area. Yeah. There's a sensitivity to that place that you have to be mindful of when you go back and play again. Yes. And so likewise, there's a weakness in me that I cultivated intentionally throughout my childhood. I hear, I hear this, yeah. That I have, to, I have to be aware of. But I think more than that, even if it wasn't there, I think it's never acceptable to portray pornography. Or to show, to, mm. I think pornography is never acceptable. And I think pornography is showing images that are intended to sexually arouse or by and large have that effect. Um, but I can't. I can't look at a, a commercial for a for a bank account without being. But that's your problem, not the, not the commercials' problem. I know. That's the difference. And I don't want to get to the point where it's like when you land in Dubai and they've got Vanity Fair magazine, and you know a woman has cleavage and they've got a texter and they've like crossed it I out. I respect that. Yeah, look, I do actually wish they did that for me personally. But I'd like to have the option of that magazine. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's a fallen world that you have to move and live in. Yeah, and some of the most erotic things that I've ever seen have been like very wholesome. I, just, I remember seeing a woman in a park a couple of years ago, and she was just like a modestly dressed woman skipping in a park, playing with her family, and I was like, "This is geez, so beautiful." Yeah, uh, I'll let that go. But, no, it's but like, again, she I wasn't mean, doing anything wrong. Not to reiterate the point, I'm sure you understood it, but I mean, for pornography to be pornography, there has to be the intention of the creator, yes. and the intention of the consumer, and they kind of need to match up, as it were. Yes. You know, like, I, I like the... You know, I think Oppenheimer would be a hard film to masturbate to. Not yeah. impossible. Yeah. But I think <laughs> I think it would be... There's unless you were really, really far gone. I think, I think it was... Was it George Weigel or somebody who talked about the nudes in uh, the Sistine Chapel? Mm. And he said, if that does elicit lust within you, mm. that should be a ringing bell that you have fallen woefully from where you ought to be and need to do some work, yeah. you know. But I think there's probably a profound difference between that and whatever was in that Oppenheimer film. I Chris find myself, Miller. you know, maybe it's kind of like if someone is, I missed that. Uh, you probably oh, no, no, go on. Go well, on. if someone had, let's say, 
let's say someone was hooked on some serious drug that ruined mm. their life and mm. ruined their marriage, right? And then they watch a movie that kind of trivializes that drug a little bit. It's, yeah. it's deeply offensive. Well, and certainly like being, as a person who likes to gamble, going to a pub that has a lot of pokies in it, like slot machine, fruit machines, you'd call them here, yeah. is a real challenge. For you? Yeah. Did you, were you kind of hooked on I gambling love it. for a while? I never have enough money to gamble seriously. Yeah. But it, I mean, Australia's gambling is like, See, I see the gambling the way I see people smoking pot, usually. Mm. Um, I find it so depressing that mm. I don't find it enticing. You know, so if I, if I walk into a bar great. and people are playing those games, I actually, I actually feel sad. You know, oh. blow up that song, Blow Up the Pokies? Yeah, yeah. What a beautiful song. They should song. force that to be played in poke <laughs> rooms to remind people. Hours. I feel that way about marijuana, but oh, I love to watch the dolphins spin around. Make a tidy little cheeky forty dollars and walk out with all my coins. It's a problem. I'm aware. I mean, the, and yeah. the catechism does permit gambling yeah. under really limited yeah. circumstances. Games of chance. Games yeah. of chance. Are, if you're just having a nice time and things are in check, that's not a problem. But yeah. I had an uncle who ruined his family because he was just using all, all this money. He had a huge gambling addiction. My auntie didn't know about it. Mm. Uh, oh, it destroys yeah. families. And yeah. in Australia, it's totally unrestricted. And America is going that way with the sports betting. Isn't that funny that they're so down on tobacco, but yeah. all for gambling? I joked earlier. Gambling will ruin your family faster than tobacco. We had eight, eight cigarettes in that pack, and I, I joked that those would be 20 bucks each in Australia. I was shocked at how expensive tobacco Here, you tried to buy a cigar. So a cigar I have I've never here. seen someone as, as bristly. I think it was a trans person serving behind the bar. and you was maybe, a trans person. I was, I was either a very muscular woman or a trans no, person. No, that was... And then you were you were, you dealt with that magnificently. Thank but you. then when they told you the price of the cigar... I, I thought you were going to pop off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Uh, Tuga says, I'm a house music DJ producer. My world is very woke and hedonistic, yet I'm a sober Catholic. James, yeah. how do you handle being a Catholic in comedy? Now, you touched on this, but... Hmm. I try not to touch on it. <laughs> That's a... Poor joke. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I mean, I go home. I go home and yeah. I, I don't hang out. My friend Sam, who actually shot those uh, quality and training purposes videos, who's he's, great. He's very talented. He's also a weekend DJ and he he's try, he's comes to mass and he really tries to, he goes, when I'm out at the club DJing, I just, I go on my phone, I play the music, I try not to look at yeah. women in bras dancing, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it's you're in the world and you've got to know where your problems are. Yeah. Um, I also had a lovely time backstage talking about, you know, America with those strippers in a very, you know, yeah. above board way. But yeah. it's also if if I found out we people were going to a strip club after a show, I would say, Thanks I can't, I can't go out with you. As cool as it is to pay women money to pretend to like you, I mean, I got to go home. It is nice when people pretend to like you, I love even it. when I'm going to just a restaurant mm -hmm. and the servers here look you in the eye and they act like they really care about you. I know they want a tip, but it is still nice. To something you know. I remember being shocked enough. at that when I moved to America. It was to Texas, mm. and I was shocked and remember saying to my girlfriend, now wife Cameron, "Why is everyone so nice?" And I quickly learned, "Oh, you tip you in tip. America." Yeah. But I'm all about that. I'm all about tipping people if they do well. I love tipping no matter what. I I'm I, refuse, burn I refuse quickly. to tip. I went to the Naples house and they made us this weird Italian, not really Italian food, this mm -hmm. American version of Italian food with your weird electric yellow cheese. Yeah. I've had a gut full of the weird <laughs> cheeses in America. Just, I tried to find the least processed cheese What, did you like Walmart. the cheese you had at my house? Yeah. Yeah, that's good cheese. That was, no, but that was real, real. expensive, yeah, yeah, wrapped yeah. French cheese. This yeah, is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, don't get me. I won't start. I won't start. The bread... The bread How is many ingredients up. can you put into a loaf of bread? Give, eh? it, give me flour and water. Yeah. You know, and whatever that third thing is, yeast. Well, I remember when we lived lived in Ireland, you'd buy a carton of milk and it would always expire within a week. You'd buy milk here and it expires in 2027. Sometime next year. Yeah, yeah. that's right. You're going to meet a fella. His name's Alex Plato. Does he's he gonna, make bread? He, he does make bread. All right. And you're going to love him. And My his wife's bread got a sourdough is, started going. That's what he does. Yeah. And it's the best sourdough. My wife makes it. I'm like, this is fine. It may be the but same. Nobody is, is as good. All right, I'll as hit, I'll Alex Plato's bread. You're gonna love it. Yeah. What's your favorite book? Oh, no, uh, nonfiction. That's unfair. Nonfiction. Yeah. Uh, fiction. Let's do fiction. No, hold on. Hold on. I can do nonfiction. Right. The Bible. Now, fiction. <laughs> uh, I mean, there was a time out of university where I just read like I read a lot of books, I a lot of long books back to back that I would struggle to differentiate. 
Uh, and if you ever become sick and you're bedridden and you need to read something, I would, you know, Infinite Jest, yeah. War and Peace, Crime and Punishment, um, you read Gone it? with the Wind. I'm I shocked love Gone with the Wind. You made it through Infinite Jest. I loved it. Yeah, it took Impressive. me three attempts and it was after he'd committed suicide and a lot of it is about... He's got some beautiful commentary on modern culture, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah, he was in ICIA before he, he died. Twi he attempted it twice. Wow. And then I think uh, killed himself. So we can hold that hope for Absolutely. David Foster Wallace because I think he... He's God. Yeah, he's um he's terrific. I never made it through the Pale King because I was too sad that he was dead. Mm. But in terms of nonfiction, yeah, a, uh, a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again is great. Consider the lobster is great. Oh, I love David Foster Wallace's. I'm trying to think of a great work of nonfiction. I just started reading Emma. That's mm. fiction by Austin. And the first three chapters I was furious because kids are screaming <laughs> and there's a hundred characters introduced at the start. And then not one new character is introduced seemingly for the rest of the book, but I'm really enjoying Austin. Uh, I actually brought Vanity Fair by yeah. Thackeray. I would hold up as my, of all those big, long, weird books. It's, it's exceptional. It's great. I, uh, yeah, Brothers, Brothers and Lord of the Rings. I never made it through Brothers. I would love to. You will. I started a couple times. You know, I often think that a... <sighs> that a book for me, especially a book that people tell me is a little difficult. It's like when you go to somebody's house for the first time and they give you a tour. Yeah. And the reason they give you a tour and the reason you like having a tour isn't just so you can see their house, but so that you can feel situated. You, you, you understand yeah. this world that you have just inhabited. Yeah. And so for me, if I'm going to read a book that's slightly more complicated, I, I, I want somebody to help me understand what it's about. You want a lot of good footnotes if you're reading. Carl's so I can up. then enter it and... Yeah. Oh, Shane Smith just texted. We should totally check out what he said to say. Oh, I, I got to read this. Uh, he's responding to a comment we just got, right? So you know who Shane Smith is. Yeah. He's Shane, I'm going to ask for your help getting gigs in this country. You know what we're going to do? You can hang out nice. You're going to hang out with Shane Smith tomorrow. Make I sure we get some photos. We, we have to do a, a double comedy header here with you and him at some point. <laughs> we have to. <laughs> Um, but listen to this comment that was that came up Thursday. You're gonna love this. This is a comment that came up under the Shane Smith interview. People watching, if you haven't watched it, you need to. He says, "My hev she says my heavily tattooed son introduced me to you. We watched you on Dry Bar Comedy together. He also sent me this video, which stunned and thrilled me as he's been away from the church. I'm excited to see how this plays out. He's a heavy metal guitarist, by the way. Isn't that beautiful?" I wish I had gotten tattoos earlier before I knew that, um, before my priest told me I was not to get them. I often feel it would be nice to have a big Southern cross, big Southern cross on yeah. the arm. But I, I now can't do it. I don't think I, there's an argument to be made that it would enculturate myself sufficiently, but I do think they're cool. Southern cross is... is Wait, what does Southern cross mean well, I don't know what he thinks, but it's a star constellation in the Southern Hemisphere that we have yeah. on the Australian flag. It's just a proud part of being an Australian. I love Southern Australian. Hemisphere. Brazil has it as well. So it's not just ours. It's I ours. love it when they say in Australia, like, it's the biggest arts festival in the Southern Hemisphere. It's like, yeah. we just beat Brazil and Chile <laughs> yeah. and Papua New Guinea. Taiwan. Oh, not that Southern, not the Confederate flag, Southern Cross. Thank oh, you for alerting us you, that fact. And right after I said I loved Gone with the Wind, that was important to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> Gone with the Wind is a beautiful, sexy, magical book. I so I just started it. reading Harry Potter because I really want to like Harry Potter. And people have told me it's excellent. People you only respect. just got to the school, though. You're going to love it. I'm past the school now. I'm, I'm you know, a few chapters past that. And I just and so this is what I'm about to say is going to sound super pretentious, but I actually mean what I'm about to say. So I'm sitting down, I'm reading it. I bought the hardbound copies. I was really excited to get into it. And, and I like it. She's a very excellent writer and the yeah, story is yeah. great. Um, but I just don't care that much and yeah. and and so i bought a collection you were with me of tolstoy's novellas yeah and i was in bed with my wife and the and peter and it was very early in the morning and i just said well let's read a story and we read a novella from tolstoy the two of them and me were gripped yes so it's not like it's this highfalutin stuff my nine-year-old no, son loved it and i thought this is so much more edifying is like very readable for anybody so i'm moving to austria tomorrow for five yeah. months as people know you're taking so, the tolstoy and i'm going to take the tolstoy yeah, and leave nice. harry potter which obviously well, is a better idea probably but I like the idea of reading fiction I'll that's you, not... Th there's a moment in the second, early on in the second Harry Potter where he's taken from his sad orphan life and he gets to go and spend the summer with what is a thinly veiled Irish Catholic family. Mm. They're poor. They have too many yeah. kids. They have red hair. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ron. Ron's family. Ron, Ron's family. And it's like 
so astoundingly charming and nicely written. What I, what I love about that, I haven't gotten to that yeah. yet, so you can follow up, but what I love about what seems to be happening there is that the author is showing the beauty and wholesomeness and goodness of this yeah. large family, even though they're poor and that people make fun of them. I mean, I think theologically we would break with J.K. Rowling on a lot of things, but she is, she's, I think, just like the best creative example of Anglicanism in the world today or of whatever that. Is she a practicing Anglican? English. I don't oh, know I, the extent to which she's practicing, but oh, yeah. she, was, she's come, she said she was a Christian. And Harry Potter is transparently a Christian. How, how so? Self-sacrifice. It's about resurrection. I, I won't spoil things that happen towards the end, but it is uh, deeply, heavily informed by the Christian worldview. And she's got maybe a more lukewarm version of that than, yeah. you know, that, that makes more concessions. But um, I can definitely see why she would not tolerate the trans thing. Because, again, she, I mean, she really believes in... Truth, right? She's like, I, I, I'm not going to go along with this thing that people are telling me that I can't make sense of, mm. um, and got into all that trouble. No, I'm a big, I love J.K. Rowling. Is she still getting into trouble? I oh, she'll just keep getting. But they love making money off her. It's nice to watch the big companies squirm. Yeah, that they want her intellectual property. They want her money. They want to make all the movies and the video games, and they want to make documentaries about her work while separating themselves from her and talking her down wherever they can. You know, trotting out yeah. someone who was in the movies to say, but we don't agree about this. Don't you think that the trans movement is eating its own head? It doesn't seem like it's got much steam left, don't? doesn't feel like it's got much steam left, <laughs> Do you does say it? don't? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I see <laughs> what's going on. Yeah. Um, it's certainly the, the one that freaks out normal, non-culture war participating people the most because – it's very hard to castrate a child and sell that as a good thing. You've got to do a lot of work. To, <laughs> you've got to have a really good singer at the end of that and the castrati movement. But it's, yeah, I think it, it, uh, it terrifies people. Yeah. Daniel wants to know, why is James McCann such a cool guy? Stay off of marijuana. <laughs> good. Aaron says, what is the best boat and why is the correct answer oh, yeah. catamarans? Well... I actually don't know anything. About, I've got a podcast about trying to buy a boat, but uh, I don't know anything about boats. But there was a couple I started watching in COVID who they're called Sailing La Vagabonda. Yeah. And they did this series where Greta Thunberg was trying to show how it was possible not to have flights. And show, it was either, she was going from Europe to America or America to Europe. And uh, she, went, she, she asked if anyone could get her there in a boat. And this Australian couple who had a YouTube channel put her on their catamaran and they sailed her across. Now, it proved the opposite because they almost died and it was terrifying. <laughs> like, and they were caught in a storm and they keep cutting to the man who's got his family and Greta Thunberg on the boat going, ah, I'm trying not to tell anyone how bad this is, but we're in a real bad situation right now. So planes maybe do have their place. But <laughs> I, she was, I really... Um, you know, it's easy to talk down on Greta Thunberg because she's a screechy easy. autistic child. But I really liked her in this series. She's like, you know, she she's again, she's pursuing the thing that she believes in. And I don't think her parents should have given her such a free hand on it because that can't have been good for her emotional well-being. But like, man, I recommend that. That boat that they have in that show that they almost die in on the high seas, that is my, uh, that's my dream boat. Is the Greta Thunberg sailboat. Do you watch other comedians regularly? Yeah. Not as much as I would like to. I heard someone say who was a comedian that they don't do that because they're afraid they'll accidentally start stealing bits. I mean, that may have been me. If you ask me on a different day, I might say that as well. <laughs> but uh, yeah, maybe when I sink you, in, I, I love it. When, I like, when I'm at a club watching other comedians, I take real joy in, yeah. in that. I find most people's hour really hard to sit through. Yeah. On Netflix, because yeah. usually people don't have a good hour. They've got a bunch of different five minutes that have been cobbled together. But this year, there have been a couple. Shane Gillis's new hour is sensational. Matt McCusker's new hour was terrific. Uh, Nick Mullen's hour, I really enjoyed. So, I mean, it's, it's still being done, and when I get into it and I like their work. But also, yeah, professional jealousy. When, when I look at someone and I think I'm better than them and they're doing well and they've got a big audience and no one... You know, here I am toiling in obscurity. You can't help but feel yeah. uh, negativity. I mean, Jerry Seinfeld has got to be a big part of why there's this seems to be this resurgence in comedy. <laughs> yeah, with comedians in cars. And he had a, well, he had a documentary. 
called Comedian, where it's him and a guy who's on the app, which is like, and it's Jerry writing his new hour oh, and sucking in front of audiences right. over and over again. It's a, it's a, yeah, I know people who watch it every year. It's a beautiful depiction of what it's like. Oh, I love Jerry. He's coming back with a new hour to Australia. Is he? And there's no way that I'll be allowed to open for him because he brings his own <laughs> opener, but I, that's a dream. Wow. What do you do for fun that's the least impressive? Yeah, you know, when you're at home. I play a lot of chess on my phone. Do you? Yeah. I Too much. Like, that is my video game substitute is yeah. bullet chess on my phone. Bullet chess? Just two minutes and you get an extra three seconds every turn. And it doesn't make me a better chess player because you can't – I can't think deeply while I'm doing it and it's just using yeah. what I know. But is I can – the ch I can, chess app or is it something I'm the chess, yeah. Thick yeah. Chess Daddy 69, if anyone wow. <laughs> wants to play a little chess. Good. I've had the account for quite a long time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I love, oh, I love finding out about my, you find out a lot of, about yourself playing chess. Like, and not always good things. Like I figured out that I, I think I'm quite a boring, non-risk taking person. I just like to get a small advantage and eke that out. And it's like, all right, well, how am I doing that? If I'm doing that in chess and that's holding me back there, mm. how am I doing that in my actual life? Maybe I'm taking enough chances and being in a new country. Oh, I hope this Toyota Camry is a good one. It's hard buying a secondhand car. Where are you getting it from someone or a dealership? I, I think it's a dealership, but he's putting it up like it's not a dealership on... Oh, yeah, I see. Man, I'm livid with how Facebook Marketplace works in America. Right. People put up like a decent price for the car and then you read through it and then they go, as a down payment, you go, oh, I was stuff you. Don't get me involved. Yeah. And then people going like, car's great, everything's great, doesn't have an engine. You know, <laughs> why have we left that until the third paragraph? <laughs> and it's also, yeah, I don't know about cars. I don't know if the car I'm about to buy is a, a bomb. Yeah. But, oh, I left my car in, I left my car in Australia. I loved my... I had a Volvo XC90 with a terrible turning circle filled with crumbs and yogurt from the children. <laughs> crumbs and yogurt. Yeah. And also a car is like the perfect recording studio in terms of how it's shaped. If you want to just sit with a microphone somewhere, That's and you why don't have a proper Matt studio. Walsh did his did he really? podcast in a, studio, in a, in a car. For I do mine in my time. car, yeah. Do you? Well, at the moment I'm doing it, I, I just, I tried to do an episode this week and I woke my whole family up. I came downstairs from the bar. I came over from the bar and I was too loud. Oh, yeah. It's hard. I've got to find a space. It's fine. I'll have a Toyota Camry very soon and I'll be hunched up talking about having a boat. What is your wife looking forward to about being here? I can see what you're looking forward to about being here, obviously. Yeah. You know, community, traveling, comedy. The community is big for her and growing in the faith. She's never seen America, so she she was quite nervous before she came in about the guns and the yeah. violence and the, the media perception. Yeah. But like... Man, once we have a car and we can just go to see a Carnegie Museum, to see a different... We walked down through the Steubenville downtown and we went to the Carnegie Library and it's just like a new public library and a new way of running it. And we were thrilled to bits. To get mm. to... I remember the, just to be with your children and showing them something exciting. I remember the first time I saw Bondi, I was grown up and I didn't have my kids there. This was only a couple of years ago. And it, I was so sad that I couldn't yes. show this thing to my children. Yes. So the... I really like the Indianapolis Children's Museum to get to get in the car, drive there together, spend time with each other talking, and then be at this exciting thing that we can share. Yeah. I'm sorry if that is a uh, hokey, but you that's and, really the dream. You and your wife are going to have to come up with a kind of dream destination just for the two of you. Oh. Um, is your youngest one breastfed? Like, yeah, I'm still breastfed. Okay, but because we, we would love, we, love you've food. got a community of amazing guys who would love to help you guys I'll do be, that. I would but. love to take her on a date. Yes, and my dad's staying with us, and that's, he's been really good. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know how good he would be because he's an older man who likes writing and his privacy and yeah. he has been a, yeah, a real blessing. He's going off to Washington. He's also understands that sometimes it's good to take a break. Yes. Because it's, it's sometimes difficult to yep. have the extended family all under one roof, but he's going off to Washington okay. and he is his estate. Or DC. DC. Yeah. He's as happy as a little girl. He's, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to see the monuments. He's so jazzed. Yeah. Just to see America. I love I, a man sounds like a sounds like a hokey and not true, but I love America. Like when I'm on stage, I, I was at Joe Rogan's club, and every set I just found I didn't plan to do it, but I was like, God bless America! This is a beautiful country, and they love hearing it, and I love saying it. I don't say that in Australia. I don't go, God bless Australia. You go, yeah. there are things about this country that I'm sure God I uh, don't like, but um, it feels so nice to be. Maybe I've just been brainwashed from a young age to say it, but did you, God bless America. Did you record that? 
bit in Aust- Austin? I, I don't know if they record the sets, but I should ask. Oh, I'd love to see it's it. It's just, I mean, it's just me doing my set and then at the end going, you people are so beautiful. <laughs> what a beautiful country this is with your big toilets <laughs> and your big car. These, something, the cars are Massive. weird. Like the perfect height to kill a whole school of kids. Like what, what are they, what is the, no one else in the world feels they need to have something that bit was four funny. yards off the ground. You know, in Australia, we've got cars and we have utes yeah. and then we have trucks and trucks mean something very specific. Whereas here, they call them trucks, even though they're utes, but I guess they're trucks because they're three times the size of our utes. Why don't they say ute? And they don't, they, they, yeah, their utes don't look like our utes. No. They're gigantic. Which is also sort of nice when you're driving a big Ford and it makes a ridiculous Everything is big. The door handle's Everything big. Is the big. lock's big. The fridges are huge. When you, this is going to be so uninteresting to everybody, but ah, let's, let's find out. It. When you open a can in Australia, it doesn't quite make the noise that a can makes in a movie. I think that the lid is slightly thinner. Okay. It's not as the al- aluminum, as you would yeah, say here. Yeah, yeah. But when I opened an American can and it went, <laughs> and it was like a sound effect of a can opening, I, uh, I was moved. <laughs> I was transported to, not to another place, but to the place I was in. Yeah. Oh. Have you found a favorite American beer? They all suck. <laughs> this one's, I mean, Sierra Nevada's all right. But God bless America. No, God bless America. But the, the beers, I can't. They go, everything is either like inoffensive and sugary and flavorless. Well, I gave you a yingling just turned, the other night. Well, Did you hate that? I like the yingling. That was like in the realm of the hops have been turned up. But it's just like they're like, ah, these beers are unsophisticated. Let's throw as many hops in that as possible. Yeah. The Cooper's Pale is mm. is the beer. I was shocked in Australia at the airport when I bought a Cooper's, just just one Cooper's, and it was yeah. about 15 bucks. Oh, yeah, they they hurt you. They hurt you. I When I was at the airport in Austin and they had vending machines for flowers, mm. like on your way out you can – Pay tw- like, not to a person, but just get your. Presumably, you've done something terrible on your trip, and you need to make that up to the wife very quickly. A bouquet vending machine. Yeah. What a country! What a weird country. Also, just having been in New Zealand, where everything is was great, but it's like small and very expensive. Something about. I was trying to figure out why the landscape in America was so moving and why in New Zealand it's picturesque and the photos look great. So good. But it doesn't like, I wasn't moved in the same way by, I think it's because there's no big animals in the forest that can kill you in New Zealand. There's not one right. mammal. There's no, it's just well, all same in Australia. Well, so a croc will get you. A croc You go the wrong big. way. There's still yeah. this stuff out there. Sure. But the thought that there are like wolves. and Bears. Uh, uh, ant- uh, you know, the deers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'd, I'd love to get into it. I'd like to go to Yellowstone and have a bear attack me and have to <laughs> fight him fight off. It off. That'd be a great story. I remember being in Canada and uh, winter had passed and we were helping someone clean up their driveway. Mm. We were putting our hands under all this wet wood and carrying it. And I thought, I mean, because I was 20 at the time, like 20 years of living in Australia has taught me never, ever to put your hands in wood like this because there's yeah, yeah. spiders and yeah, snakes yeah, yeah. and but all things just that'll kill it. you. You just touch the wood. But I'm less afraid of these perhaps more deadly things like king brown snakes and redbacks than I am these giant things that could hunt you and stalk you and eat you. I mean, I don't like that they're reintroducing. The rewilding thing in America is, I do find that. What's this? Like there'll be areas where wolves used to be and they've gotten rid of all the wolves because they kept killing people's, (laughs) you know, everything. (laughs) And they're reintroducing wolves. They're rewilding. They're like trying to get wolf life back. Mm. As much as I love that there's wildlife here, I think it's a mistake to. Yeah. Once you've gotten rid of it, just be happy yeah. that it's gone. Yeah, you've Let's already. Let's not bring snakes back to Ireland, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This is this is fun. Thank you for being on my show. Well, if I when you're back from Austria, mm-hmm. I'd like to. I'm going to meet this Shane man. Yep. He seems nice. This is great. I've had a I've had a wonderful time. I'm going to go and haggle with a man about a Camry. That's good. At a dealership. At a, oh, I haven't haggled at a dealership ever. Do you have a number that you're not going to come down from? That you know that if he doesn't take it, you'll just leave? Well, or? he's not going to be watching this, so I can say that he's already asking a very reasonable price. Oh, see, yeah. So if I don't get any ground, yeah. I still have to buy that car. But Now, do you need... I just... Because I'm going to Austria, I just got this uh, you know, universal license or whatever. Do you have to do something like that? There are some states where I can't drive in and you can only get that universal license in the country that you're from. Yeah. But if I stay out of Alabama, I think they'll allow me to have my, <laughs> <laughs> they don't seem to check. There's like a much lower police presence on the road. I read on the Wikipedia about the one speed camera in, in Steubenville, Steubenville yeah. that they got rid of because the townspeople decided 
Better not to have it. I don't want that. Yeah. No speed camera. That's very dangerous. No seatbelt, no speed camera. James McCann, in memoriam. 1991 to 2024. Just pop that down there. Cindy says, when James, I am blind as a bat, when James is ready to see the Grand Canyon, we're ready to help him out here in the West. I'll do it. If you can put us up, we'll come. I don't know you. (laughs) You're probably a nice person. (laughs) I would love to see the Grand Canyon. I would too. I've never seen it. I'd love to go to, um, where do I want to go? Wyoming. I'd love to go see Wyoming. Yeah. I've never been there. I've been to almost all states, but. Is there a big town in Wyoming with? I don't know. It's a square, right? It's just like a perfect geographical square. It's very sparse, very rugged. That's yeah. all I know. Some of the states, I can't believe they get to be states. Yeah. They're so small and they get two people. Rhode Island. <laughs> Rhode Island, you got... I just found out that people live on the, one of the small islands in Hawaii. Like, you look at Hawaii on the map. None of them are on the big island. Yeah. I'd love to go to Hawaii. I've got to break up that flight. That flight's obscene. Yeah. Yeah. How long is the flight to Austria? I don't know. Probably about... Well, I go to Amsterdam. So that's probably like seven hours or so. Yeah. That's not too bad. You'll get through that. Yeah. And, and I, I, this is what I've learned now, right? Because I'm a lot more awake in the morning, obviously. So traveling in the morning is nice. Yeah. But with kids, I want them to sleep. Yes. And I don't want them just to watch movies. Yeah. So we're going to leave about 8 p.m. from Detroit to nice. Amsterdam. So hopefully oh. they'll fall asleep at some point. And your kids are old enough that you can you can drink on that flight. Yeah. I just started doing... Of the big flight, I don't know if this is illegal or what, but I, I bought the duty free bottle of Jack Daniels and the Coca Cola, and I went to the disabled toilet and drank half the Coca Cola and just had a Jack Daniels on the flight because they were gonna. What do they charge you? They charge you like fifteen dollars a drink on the flight, oh. and I, I just, I got very drunk and watched Lord of the Rings and had a conversation with a man from Denver, <laughs> and my wife had to come oh. over with the children separately. Well, that was the worst thing I've ever done. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never not be sorry for it. I have all the, all the things the all chemical the, alterations no, i have to, all these status so it's all free oh. I, tra- I travel so much with delta that it's <sighs> to get into a nice lounge that's nice yeah makes you feel but they i mean it, it, the flight of the i want to i'm trying to write something for new polity about how they won't make flying pleasant like something about trains was always nice and the there's a romance about trains that yeah. in, in the airport no matter how much money you have no matter what you're doing unless right. you have a private jet they find a way to make you feel like an animal. Yeah. Have you ever been on the GAN? No. Is up, and down, up and down the guts of the country. I did, well, the, yeah. I did the overland. Perth to Sydney, isn't it? Now, hold on. I think it's Perth to Sydney. The yes. GAN is Adelaide. I think the GAN's Adelaide, Darwin, and the overland is... Oh. Is it the overland that's Perth, Sydney? But I, really like I love those trains. They got rid of the sleeper carriages, but that's oh, my... Come on. That's the, my fantasy. The GAN is one of the longest the rail rides in Australia, stretching from Adelaide. You were right. I got well, it. My apologies. Oh, no, I know. I'm, in I South would, Australia to Darwin. I would so love to go to the GAN. It's like $3,000. So it's not like yeah. a convenient way yeah. to do it. Is it, do you feel like an animal on the GAN, I guess? Is it nice? Oh, they'd bring you the most succulent meats really? and cheeses. <laughs> <laughs> and, and little chandeliers. Yeah. Sometimes what my YouTube algorithm falls into someone just like, doing a train like most expensive trains and they're like look at this on the japanese bullet train i've got my own toilet yeah, yeah. and i go gee it'd be the gan prides you, itself as being a somewhat upper class i think they're trying or? to sell themselves as a la da experience yeah, i like that. it's too outside of your pints with aquinas brand to suddenly pivot to the gan lifestyle experience <laughs> <laughs> it's now in pints with aquinas i'm in one of the best hotels in the world <laughs> yeah i'd say so that's funny. Gee, I wonder if I have wiggle room. I'd lo- yeah, I would wiggle so room. love to have as a business expense. I'm buying a $6,000 bottle of water. No, it's good to deprive the self. Tracy KD pointed out, and I remembered this, Shane Smith, who you'll meet tomorrow, calls Wyoming one big Walmart parking lot. <laughs> He's dry <laughs> part special. I mean, that's that's risky because you're going to be in Wyoming one day to do stand I also really enjoyed my time in the Walmart parking yeah. lot. It was magical. This big... Marion Blue that they've got it painted. Mm-hmm. Walmart is a very special place. People talk it down, but it, you like it. Oh, I liked it for twenty five minutes, and yeah. then I wanted to vomit and lie on the ground. <laughs> it was a real pivot. It's so how good Walmart. When my wife and I used to live in Ireland, we came. I say, see how I pronounce Ireland. Yeah, yeah, you, know, you get it right. It's you like when your wife for... says Melbourne. Yeah, and it's just one bit of the accent that yeah. sticks out. I came back and we went into a Walgreens in Dallas because my in laws live in Dallas. And the two of us nearly yeah. were shocked at how big it was. It's weird that you can buy cigarettes at a pharmacy. It is weird. Yeah. 
everything is a health food store and then they got malt Not liquor. to mention get the COVID jab at a pharmacy. That's a joke. Wow. They were making money doing it. They were getting paid per jab. Excuse me. I'm not going to... Ooh, we'll just leave that out. We'll just... <laughs> we touched a nerve. <laughs> on, uh, on Minecraft. That's what we're talking about. So basically, whenever we say things that I are trust potentially the science. offensive I believe to in YouTube, the science, did you say? We Minecraft? say, well, on Minecraft. You... Oh, I think it's all the pendulum's about to swing back the other way. I keep saying that it's never going to happen. Here's my goal, yeah. and we'll see in three months if I'm able to make it work. I want to get you in front of Daily Wire. Yeah, please. Executives please. and people I'll take you up and on managers. It. I want to get you I'll down. I'll record a Daily Wire special in a I want to make that happen. I would like I, to help I, I them. say I. i got no, no I'd, control I'd like except to I can make an introduction. Their, what they're doing, I like that they're trying to make like... Just normal, open yeah. for consumption movies and yeah. have an alternate ride. And well, it'll be nice to meet Ben Shapiro. And well, he uh, lives in Florida. I was just down there recently. So he yeah. doesn't live there, but maybe we can get you to meet him. No, I want to push The last him. movie was terrible. Did you watch it? Lady Balls? It was absolutely I awful. Did not get to. Awful. I heard you say it was bad and then I yeah. didn't watch it. Yeah. I respected the fact that they tried and I thought the premise was great and I love when people give Hollywood the middle finger. I'm all about it. Look, it if just, I can cycle back to something three hours the ago. The problem was it wasn't it, funny. It's hard to. It, being funny is. If you have anything else that you're trying to push or any agenda or anything that you're trying to teach or anything, the funny disappears. I don't know. It's, it's like a poison that touches yeah. it. So I, this, and there's also, if you just set out to make a comedy movie and it happened to be about that, you could probably do it. But I imagine there would still be some confines of things that you would be funny that you could reach out and do in a movie that you, could, you just couldn't do in a Daily Wire yeah. Film. Maybe. Maybe I'm wrong. Daily Wire. Prove <laughs> I me, love write you. me a big check to write a script and <laughs> see if I'm right. What is one of the your funniest movies? Oh. Um It's not fair. Well, before you, Do you know what? The one I most recently watched and watch again and I couldn't believe how funny it was was It's a Wonderful Life. I never grew up with It's a Wonderful Such Life. Such a good movie. It's never on TV in Australia. It's so dark. It is it's dark. so funny. Mm -hmm. And then I went back and watched a bunch of other Frank Capra. It happened one night. It was like the first romantic comedy. I can't wait to watch it. It's outstanding. It's yeah. so funny. Clark Gable and a really great actress. Did you uh, watch the Twilight Zone group? Twilight no, Zone growing up? No, I highly no, no. recommend that too. I Did just you started, get that? Well, I, not in Australia, but people started telling me about it here. I started watching it with the kids. They love it. Yeah. It's excellent. It's so funny when you go back and that there, like some things are hokey. Some things, when you go back and watch something from yeah. the 40s, you go, it's unbelievable that this was ever made at the time. But yeah. then you watch like Hitchcock. Absolutely. And it's alive. And, and it could be made best, today. Yeah, he's nailed the genre and no one yeah. can improve upon it. That's how it feels. He's um, So it's, it is nice to go back and find those old things. I and mean, it wasn't funny, but I watched uh, All Quiet on the Western Front. Mm, I recommend I that. I didn't watch it. Ah, it's German boys dying in trenches. Oh. I wept like a... <laughs> I, was, uh, I was very emotional. I asked, really funny. I asked uh, Peter Kraft, you know who that is? No. He's a philosopher from Boston College, brilliant guy. Yeah. He'll be up there with Lewis and Tolkien once he's passed. I mean, people, he's incredible. I'll take his book. Have yeah. you got a, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know what? I'll give you a signed copy of his book. We have one in the lounge. Write your name in the so I don't uh, well, abscond. No, I want you to have it. That's why I'm giving oh, you I'll a take signed it. I'll take it. See, but what did, he, what did he say? Well, I asked him what his favorite movie was, and I think he asked me mine first, and I gave a very embarrassing answer, then he gave a very good one. What was, what was your answer? I was like, ah, oh, dumb and dumber. <laughs> it's and, very funny. And he said, that certainly is a stupid movie. And I'm like, oh, what's yours? And he went, A Man for All Seasons? I went, uh, I just I? watched A Man for All Great Seasons at movie. my priest's recommendation. Great movie. Wales, Richard? And I read it on the flight over here. I got the script. Did you? This is weird. It's such uh, a good movie. He was only made a saint. Is it Thomas More? Yep. He was only made a saint in the 20th century because the Church of England was continued to be right. against him. And before I watched A Man for All Seasons, I watched Hilary Mantel's story about him, okay. uh, which is Wolf Hall, which is like a pro Cromwell yeah. retelling of that, which is, it's got a great actor in it playing Cromwell, but it's like, evil. it's an evil depiction yeah. of this great man yeah. and his conscience. The movie, yeah, A Man for All Seasons was... I couldn't believe that no one had recommended it to me it's so before good. then. Well, that's another example, years. right? Where you think of this as old, it might be hokey. No, it was more so powerful alive. than Braveheart, I thought. I yeah, was that movie. It's by. that good. It, there's interesting. There are. Oh, can I get one more? Big Mel yeah. one. Signs. I haven't the watched that in a long time. Mel Gibson time. gives in Signs is my favorite acting performance I'd love to go back ever. and watch that, yeah. I, uh, I'm putting it out here. I'm, I'm never going to have an opportunity to say, I want to meet Mel Gibson. Mel. If you're out there, I love you, and I'd like to meet Mel Gibson if that's the one. Acts I can grind. I love Mel Gibson. Yeah. And so many people in the Catholic thing are one or two degrees removed from Mel Gibson totally. or remember him from a, one time or another, that he is like 
obviously he's had demons that he struggled with and mm-hmm. he's evolved as a man. Th- the most talented person to come out of Australia ever. Like yeah. unbelievable. Even when South Park did all the directors and they're like, they made, they're like Mel Gibson's a crazy person in his underpants running around or whatever. <laughs> they still came back to it. But man, he's a good director. Very he's good. an unbelievable director. Just a genius living in our time. Anyway, I love you, Mel Gibson. I know. I don't know if Mel is a local subscriber. He uh, might be. There's an above twenty percent chance, I would say, that Mel is. <laughs> there are movies that the kids hate the idea of. Yeah. But as soon as it turns on, they're gripped. A couple of examples. We watched one last night. Sound of Music. Yeah. Mary Poppins would be another yeah, one. Yeah, like yeah. there are movies. Like, I'm not going to bloody I mean, she's watch Mary Poppins. She's she's, uh, she's incredible. Yeah. Princess Diaries. She's great. Mm, I haven't seen uh, Julie that. Andrews. It's uh, Princess Diaries is not as good as those other movies, but <laughs> Julie Andrews is magical. Beautiful. Yeah, when it's a lot of the older Disney ones are just, I don't know when the last great Disney movie was, but they were on a formula for a while that was just churning out nothing but great movies. Yeah. Here's a good movie I want you to check yeah, yeah. out. All right. Three Billboards Outside Never watched Ebbing, it. Missouri. I didn't watch it. Highly, young highly children. recommend it. Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, right. Missouri. Is it Missouri. Doris Lessing? What's it? No. Why am I saying Doris? What's the actor's name? Um, Actress. I'm really bad at names. A three billboards. Starring Francis McDormand Francis and McDormand. Mildred Hayes. Who is Doris Lessing and why has that name come to me? I watched this movie with my wife and I said, this is no, like- Doris Lessing is a Zimbabwean novelist, excuse me. <laughs> it, it just, it, it kind of, it gave me faith in movies again. It, it's possible for movies to be beautiful and thought provoking and- yeah, I couldn't tell you More the last. More than just a bowl of Skittles, you know? I, re- I liked the first Wonder Woman movie. Yeah, that was good. And I think there's a lot to be said about how, like... She's so beautiful. She's she's also, like, she's the, the church and, and it's, like, self-sacrifice mother. and the Blessed Mother yeah, and, yeah, like, yeah. she's a hero in a very feminine way. Yeah. And so I took my wife as, like, the first thing we were going back to see after a year of not being to the cinema because we'd had a child to the second Wonder Woman movie. Walked out. Yeah, One of the worst things you? I've ever had to see. I couldn't believe... It was disgraceful. But, yeah, like a good current movie. I couldn't tell you the last great movie that I had seen. I'll watch that one. A lot of bad movies. A lot of bad movies. Uh, let's make good movies. I, 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 yeah, first thing I'll do is I'll, I'll go online and just type in family review to see how much sex are they about to surprise <laughs> me with. And if there's not, then I'm... I'm really you know. trying to think of like one good movie that I've seen of late. All Quiet on the Rest and Front was a newer movie that was really good. But very um, bleak, and I would never show a child. Oh yeah, please uh, that film. Um, Darkest Hour. Is Darkest that? Hour is good. Oh, I haven't seen Darkest Hour. Gosh, one of the best movies I've ever seen about Winston Churchill. Oh no, I did see the Darkest that Hour. Was good. Gary Oldman. Yep. Is it Gary what Oldman or is it the other yep, one? Oldman. That's it. Oldman. What an actor. The King's Speech. It was. I enjoyed the King's Speech, uh, but I, I don't think I could. Oh, actually, when he's talking and they're playing Beethoven Seventh, it is. Pretty nice. I'm trying to think of like the last. Do you know what the best TV show? If I'm a, if I could recommend one thing that anyone yeah. could watch, All right. and if you're on the flight and you want to watch something, the the uh, the second season is the best. The first season is really good. The OA, it was the on OA. Netflix. It got cancelled. Uh, Brit Marling is, I think, the best the person working in What's it about? show business today. Uh, it's about a girl who disappears and she was blind when she disappears and she comes back having had an experience and it's her sitting in a room with, she goes out and finds children from the local high school and has this like mystic message that she has to convey to them. And you don't really know how much is her being insane or, and it's a lot of flashbacks and it's, this is one of the reasons it was canceled is it's quite hard to talk about in a compelling way, but she's just made a a show that was really good. I don't, it didn't move me the way that the OA moved me. And they didn't surprise you any hardcore homosexual pornography for fun. They didn't, there was none of that. You know, you got to leave that with me because I'm not. No, I don't think there is. But <coughs> it's made the OA is having a blow up moment now that people are going back and finding her back catalogue. And it's uh, oh man, Thursday. You have watched the OA? No, no one watched the OA, and they can't. And a when lot, it was cancelled, yeah. people had hunger strikes outside of Netflix. Yeah, because they were people went loony. Wow. It's um, I don't think no. There's not a lot of it says sex in lot. it. Is, did they say that? I mean, I haven't seen what kind. Of, I will know. peruse it again with a more keen eye. Uh, it's, uh, if you think you can handle the OA, if you're a person who inclines towards asexuality and self-control, <laughs> I recommend it. Justin says, Matt, favorite go-to cigar? What, is, what is, Does go-to mean what Off you have shelf. regularly yeah, yeah. or kind of easiest, cheapest one? What does that uh, well, mean? What did go-to? you just have then? 
Is that a, what is was that a luxury? This one? Yeah, this is actually quite good. This is a HVC 10th anniversary. I really like that. But my, and you yeah. still can't get Cuban cigars in this country? I do, illegally, all the time. I love it. You're open. On <laughs> Minecraft. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, <laughs> what? Now, you're a big you're a big cigarette smoker. Would you ever no, try look, a cigar? I, I, I try cigars. I, you just don't. I smoke a lot for like condensed periods of time, then I'll go a few months without smoking. And it's quite hard in America because they're so cheap. Yeah. Um, the and price really did stop me doing it in Australia. Yeah, and the cigar lounge, it's just a fun place it's so to nice. hang out. But there's you something about learn. not being able to inhale. Yeah, because like we don't let you smoke c- cigarettes in the And cigar rightly lounge. so. And because it damages the butt pipes and atmosphere. Cigars. And a cigar we is just like c- wafting. Cigar- we have it's little, around the head. We have little you know? cigars too. You I like to punch probably. it deep in the lung <laughs> and push it back out again like it's an apple. You yeah. know, like you just ah, take it. Uh, it's in me. It's a uh, it's a problem, and I I know that. Well, brother, I'm so glad that you live with us in this town, and I hope that the good Lord will permit and will you to stay here for many many years, and our children grow all together, and we can get to know each other more. Brother, love brother, you. Thank you for having. What are we doing? Uh, How about you? Do you know what my daughter said today? Because she's just started fist pumping. <laughs> she said, "I came down this morning. I said, good morning, honey.' And I taught her fist pumping on yeah. the plane. She said, "I want to fist bump the sun." I said, "Oh yeah." <laughs> and then she said, "To make it die." And it's like, "Oh yeah." <laughs> You're like, well, I've got to go and do an interview now, but that's a, thank you for leaving me on that. You're like, it's January. Uh, she wants that sun to disappear. It's already dead. She thinks the sun is getting in the way of more snow. She oh, had a nice is that time with the snow. Right? I think that might be what... Children are fantastic. I don't know what else to make sense of it other than she's a Mr. Burns-like character who wants to get rid of the sun. Children are so great. I often say that Peter is living in a different story to me. That's nice. And so it annoys me what he's doing because my story is get your shoes on and get in the yes. bloody car. I think I'm often a villain in my children's yeah. story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas Peter's story is, I don't know, if I fill my mouth with snow, maybe I'll turn into a snowman. Like something completely yeah. random all the time. And if I just try to get into his story, you know, from uh, that worldview, it all children, makes sense. My and children it's beautiful. are going to a lamppost. I just know they're going to do it. And if I tell them not to do it, they'll definitely do it. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out how do I... At least sanitize the lamppost by your house. Oh, I'll just get stuck. Yeah. They'll just... I've seen it in movies. I used to do that. I used to open up my freezer because I would see it on American movies. And you would and lick the I freezer? I never saw snow. So I'd open up the freezer and I'd lick the metal bar to see what would happen. Hurts. <laughs> they only have to do it once. Maybe I could maybe I could organize them doing it in a safe environment. <laughs> That's right. Kind of like rather you lick it under my house. they yeah. get older so they don't go crazy just when they leave the house. So that we can watch you look after you. Well, I've got, yes, I'll go buy that car, yep. and we're going to watch the Steelers. Thank you so much for having me on. This is this is beautiful. God bless you, brother. Thank God you, Thursday, bless. and happy birthday to Thursday. Everyone say happy birthday in the in the comments section of Thursday, and tell him he's amazing. <laughs>